our YouTube channel, which is now getting traffic because it's got some amazing stuff starting to happen, including podcast. Maybe. Yeah, that's that's the year for us, everyone. It's time to grow the community. Those watching for these amazing wisdom classes, and networking meetings, and, and mentoring we do. Channel, which is now getting traffic because it's got. Look at that, it's me. Um. Okay. We are. You were getting the feedback, so it's all good now. Okay. So now it's the old. See who wants to come along um, and enjoy this. And I'm going to also let some people know on social media. Which Now, works. what I'm just wondering, Rich, is because we're doing that and there was a handout that I actually made available for everybody. It. Well done, you. And yeah. I can upload it to the Zoom as a downloadable file for everyone that comes in the waiting room. It'll go, hey, get this file. We're on to cool. Somehow we're on to things. I don't know how. That's good. <laughs> just, just get on That's thing. great. Yeah, we, we, we live on some wings and some prayers and other such things. Um, oh, there we go. That looks beautiful. That looks good. So, yeah, traditionally, as we move forward and everyone watching this recording, beautiful core community members, you all knew that this year is the year we're going to blow this up and bring in more amazing people like you. So that means whenever we've got a wisdom class like we do tonight, we would share, how do I say it, share the shit out of it, yeah? <laughs> we would get it out there and um, on socials and out and for our, you know, potential community um, because they're amazing. All right, cool. So, Kerry, I'll just get the PDF sorted and... Which will be here yeah. as well. My okay, head? here we go. Are people saying they can or can't get in? I'm um, just. So you you got in with the what link, Kerry? The link that Martin texted you. Yes. Okay, so I'm just. I'll just try this. Link that came on the SMS. Ah, uh, is it different to the one? Okay, I'll just see. Oh, yeah, this looks right. Let me just triple, quadruple check. <laughs> so that, you're, you're rejoining on your phone from the link that came in the SMS. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, it look, I just copied the invite link. Yeah, Sharon John. Some okay. There's people coming. It must be right. Those of you watching the recording, this is just a. You know, we're just pretending we weren't sure about that. Well, it's only just gone seven o'clock. Which be fair. <laughs> yeah. No, we're going to give people seven minutes. Okay, so great. Three, one of the things that we can do is um, is we can we can now send a chat to to the waiting room. Right. Um, do you want to write something? Like, you know, so if imagine we're going to let them all into the waiting room. That's the plan. Um, but everybody, and, everybody in YouTube's already seen it, right? Does it matter? No, yeah, but there's only that's people completely external that may or may not have seen the YouTube notification. Um, I'm just going to triple check that the link is 100 percent on, and. Yeah, so no, that got me through. The link that's in the SMS definitely and the got us. That's in, and ends yeah. in 9-7? Well, no, it's 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 a completely different looking thing, obviously, but it's It's a bitly it link or a short link. Yeah, it's a short link, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hang on, but the link going out in the email... link going out in the email i yeah you need to test that too but definitely the sms one looks right uh, okay so it's actually the link going out in the email seems to be this one 
which I'll have to send. Okay. <laughs> there, there's another. I'm going to text you the link. I'm going to leave join and reset up. And then I think this is the link that people have that have got, right? For some reason. Oh, hang on. Uh, this see. is the, the link that's this link here is the link that's on share here. Yeah, I need the, to set. Yeah, but it's and not the And it's the link that's in events. And it's it, the link that's in the SMS. Yeah, so it's not the link in the email. The top. email it looks like it may be the wrong one by the sounds of it. So there's an email. So what I'll have to do, hey, Asia, hi, Asha. I'm going to have to. I think I'll reset that link because that email went out to everyone. Um, and then I'll just repost a link and share here, and we'll fire that one up. What do you reckon? Uh. Because well, there's the, a link in share here that's this one that we're already on. Yeah. Yeah. And I just great. repost it and send out and tell everyone that that's, that that's the new link. The reason why uh, is because there's quite a few people that would get the email and that might want to join. Well, what about that? all the people that got the SMS? Where, who does the SMS go out? Sorry, Asher, that you. I know. This is. Um, well, they would have. I just got the email 20 minutes ago. Can you, What's that link say? That link is a Zoom link that ends in 878, which is different. That's yeah, right. that one popped up as an invalid link when I went to press on it. So, yeah, same here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've just done that, and it came up as an invalid link. It's tricky. Well, it, but I think it will work if I restart and open the meeting, and then I'll just repost that link into the clan and I'll send it out as a message, yeah, because the people in the community we can get to, that are online, we can get to them quite easy, whereas all the people that receive the email were, are probably except, sitting in that waiting room now. Except the SM, no, they can't get through because it says the link is invalid. Yeah, you'd because be better off, not You'd be why. better off to copy the link from what you shared in the in the clan group to um, resend the email because... Um, mm -hmm. That'll be saying it's invalid. Yeah, and so if they've gone on, they will have already. And everybody else is already coming in here. Yeah, and mm. we're going on. We're going on YouTube here live now. That's already. right. Here we are. We Done. have to get on with it. Done. Yeah, that's it. Decision made. Um. There we okay. go. That's it. That's the decision. And I will, in the background, try to find a way to get this one out to those people yeah great that's what i'll do and see who shows up awesome so can we give because we know this crew that are here hey Anne, hey Suzanne, can we give five minutes for me to rejig that for those people just to see if they want to come in because for some reason it generated the the other link sure. i'll just send it to them i just switched to gallery view so i can see everybody hello everybody yeah, I can see everyone. hey and let's just <laughs> pause. Is everybody as hot as I am this evening? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's warm. It's, it's warm in Sydney. It's warm in yeah. Adelaide as well. And I'm in an yeah. honour. I don't want to upset the whole thing, but I've had first day of school. Um, so if my camera goes off, it's not that I don't love you all. <laughs> yeah, no, I just no. have to be present for them because it's been a very big day. Right. <laughs> Back. It is a big day. Yeah. Trust me. And can I just say, kids are really unkind. Oh. Not my kids. Well, they can be. But, yeah. yeah. Kids can there's, be very mean. Yeah, there's just some really they unkind energy vibrating at the moment. So, yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. It was always one of those challenging times. When I used to work in schools, that was always a bit of fun. Um, first day of school was always really difficult to wrangle their attention back in. <laughs> but it was always full of stories of, you know, fun stuff people had done over the holidays and all of that. So it was all pretty good. Oh, while we're waiting, can I tell you um, the the positive power of manifesting thing I just wish to share? Um, you know, since I put the offer in on the house in Corfu that I keep talking about the fact that I'm going to make a TV series out of it, um, I had put a post up in a group that's called Renovating in Corfu 
And over the weekend, I was contacted by a TV production company in the US asking me, um, that telling me that they were looking for people who had taken on old houses and were going to renovate them and would I be interested in them um, filming it for their new TV series. <laughs> so I just went, yeah, stop, no problem. Um, surprise. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so Amazing. anyway. Yes, it will. Um, it's really interesting how things are turning out. Thank, thank goodness for that full moon. All I'm gonna say. Yeah, <laughs> it was good to put all that stuff gone. Um, I haven't had quite a, a full moon ceremony like it in years. I, it was just me, the fire pit, and uh, I think there was a good dozen sheets of A4, and I was just <laughs> writing essays and burning them and off you go and then I you know did you have to go I, to Bunnings to buy the new fire pit yes <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter was complaining about the fact that I'm buying yet another thing that we can't transport and so you know I gave in and I just said I'll, I'll just get the little $20 brazier but I actually have to have a fire and I have to have it contained so you know which was um it was good um so it was, yeah, it it was just a really, uh, just such big energy, this bit, but it's been really, um, really positive ever since. So it's been good. That's awesome. And Kerry, just for a little synchronicity or, or nod, but it's funny that you say Corfu because um, I travelled there last year for my brother's wedding and his now wife is Greek and Corfu is their home village. Oh, so yeah. Also got lots of village connections as well. So Do you remember the name of the village? Oh, I mean, they're all they're all Greek names. Um, yeah, it, I know. It was like <laughs> something was like. It in, was it near the beach or was it in, in the middle yeah. of the island or north or south? It was something That'll like help. a Agelos Beach? Uh, Agios? There's yeah. a few Agios because Agios is kind of, it means beach. So right. <laughs> there'll be there'll be Agios Georgiades, Agios. There's a whole bunch of that different ones, good. but it depends on which one. Um, but there's one near, so where I've bought the house is actually in the middle of the island. In right. fact, it is in the base chakra of the mermaid. You know that oh, wow. the Corfu is is shaped like a mermaid, the okay. island. That's and, really cool. Uh, and Greek mythology actually says that um, that's where the Greek gods all went to play. So that's why music and food and dancing and mm -hmm. so you know that's all good. Um, oh, Naomi's just sent a, another text message saying, "Sorry, the previous link was wrong. It wasn't." <laughs> Hang Don't on. we love technology? Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. We are we going are to get gonna better, better at this. <laughs> so <laughs> the reason why is because the, yeah, everyone on the other, <clears throat> so on the other link, that's what's happened, Martin, is that when we copied the link from the, from the Zoom platform, it was, it was a different link to the one that's in the, the platform. This is a bit of a we'll get there with this. That's that's that is what it is. So I've sent out hopefully that that's the right one. So that text though has got the right link in it anyway. It to... does have, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I just followed the last email that I got that said to join. But yeah, Kerry, I've been busy playing in the Greek mythology with a lot of other things as well. Um, because you remember how I was talking about my liver? Yes. While I'm on the liver journey. Yes. So I have been studying the story of Parthenos, I think that's his name. Parthenos. Mm -hmm. Yep, because he um, was bad to Zeus because he slept with one of however many of Zeus's wives um, <laughs> and Zeus persecuted him to some mountain where he would be um, set upon by vultures for his eternal that's life. Right but they were oh, yeah. actually attacking his liver. And the thing is, is that the liver is the only organ that regenerates. So therefore yep. his persecution was eternal. Oh, wow. <laughs> so 
seeing as how we were talking about Corfu and I pulled it up on the maps, so you should be able to see, let me angle it properly, that that's Corfu, the island, and and she's the a mermaid. mermaid. So you can yeah. see the tail um, head up here, forearms. I'm trying to do this opposite way, <laughs> forearms down here and, and her chest, like she's and got then- her head proud. And where that oh, yes, red yes. dot is is where my house is. Uh, now, and what's the I name sus- of the village? That's called Kinapiastis. Now, I suspect what you see here in the yellow dot is the beach that you were talking about where you actually had the wedding. And you can see the red dot in the middle next to it is where my house is. It's only like 10 minutes away. Yeah. It, so you're not that far away from Corfu town? No, it's about 10 minutes, 10, 10 minutes drive to the airport depending on traffic. Let's yeah. remember there's only one road. Um, so. And what's really interesting about Corfu is from an archaeological perspective, it was one of the only islands that was also connected um, with the Stonehenge. I'll have to talk to you about that, Kerry, because all the archaeology that I studied, because I actually worked in Mallorca, Yep. And so the Taliots, the actual what Stonehenge is. Yes. Right. There's actually a lineage of connection of archaeological history that comes down all the way through to Corfu as well, even though it's Greek. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now that makes sense because Corfu is also on a ley line that runs between Mount Carmel and Israel. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so, so yeah. there's some interesting sort of connections and that was one of the things that for whatever reason that house where it is, it's one of the oldest houses in the village too and that village is also, um, interestingly, uh, the one, there's a, a taverna there that's been running continuously for 370 years awesome. and <laughs> so many people just come to the village just to go to that taverna because it's amazing. Um and the meal stuff, when you book in there, it's all just like a sort of it's you get what you're given and there's lots of food and uh, and yeah. you just get given the order of the day of whatever it is. So um, but, pretty amazing yeah, stuff. That was like, yeah, because I used to live in Cyprus. So that was the sort of on the Greek half. Um, so my, my business partner is actually studying in Cyprus. So he goes back and forth from Antalya to Cyprus. So interesting, just those sort of connections. So there's a few more things we have to catch up on, Suzanne. Yes, we do. Well, when you come to Radelaide, there will be yeah. more. The only reason my picture's off is because I'm walking around the house. Um, That's fair. <laughs> so, That's fair. But I'm here, um, so you don't need to. That's okay. You can have. You can walk around the house with your picture on. This is the entrepreneur tribe, you see. <laughs> There's, oh, no don't mask. Mask. There's no mask. There's no mask here. You can kind of, you know, you can just be what's really going on. I don't, like to, I don't like to multitask, but you have to understand at this hour of the evening, it's like I just have to, you know, I've got where we've got. I've just, I've done baths. Um, Happy day. It's good. I did actually think that you'll laugh, Rich, because I was thinking to myself, you know, because normally when I when I present. You know, I kind of, I, I make sure I've, I've got the lippy on and I, I've done my hair and, you know, all that. And I was actually thinking to myself, eh, probably I don't really have to worry tonight about all that. <laughs> but then my brain was in that space of kind of going, yeah, but it's me. And <laughs> at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I'm I'm still cash in my T-shirt stuff, but it's still me. All right. Well, the, the power, the power is going to be in the wisdom. And I guess for anyone, because obviously people are going to watch they watch these wisdom classes, you know, later, right? New members will go back through the, the wisdom bank. They'll see this one. They can see your name and they find a link to you to get in contact or the rest of it. So the beauty is in the wisdom and in the knowledge. And I guess we could get to it soon. We've still got people sort of lining up. So the tech glitch, I just worked it out. Um, when I copied the link, I was logged in the wrong Zoom account and it gave me the wrong link. And I emailed that out to 2,000 people. Oh. which is our entire database of two years of reaching out to people on LinkedIn about our amazing community. But it looks like it looks like the text message, which went out to a couple of hundred people because we we collected phone numbers as well, was correct. So we'll, yes, see, who com- we'll see who comes. But it's good learning. Martin and I had a session today where, you know, it's like a reaffirmation of we've got to get that stuff going. So we've got a beautiful, smooth process. But I think 
as well in future, we're going to turn to our community members. We're going to turn to you guys to 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 tell people that there's a wisdom class on. You know, it's not that that's going to be the method. I think. I think it's great if we can open them up to other people to on occasion show yeah. them what it's yeah show them what it's about, which I yeah, think well, is if, fantastic. If we can set those if we can set those boundaries down because it's just like you know I mean, Carrie, I wanted to share that you were talking um, on my socials, but I didn't because I was just a little bit unsure what the rules well, that, are. Yeah, and that's so, but that's the thing. So. Now you now you could have, but it's kind of like I think twenty minutes before the class is a bit late in yeah. the day for people to change things around. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. but anyway, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I I sort of think um it gives us an opportunity to to ease back in, and um I think once everybody who's here, I'm a big believer that whoever's here is meant to be here, and then what they learn from it, they'll be able to take forward with you them know- and share with others. So. For sure. And you know what would be lovely, Terry, it was if like old previous members that we miss, you know, that we've been missing and grieving yeah. and not seeing them like Lee Tudor and be amazing oh, yeah. he showed up. Yeah, he, yeah, he is here. Guy. It'd be yeah, amazing if we saw Lee's here. face and heard his big uh big accent. We know we've been missing that big fella. <laughs> we see so, his name, but he hasn't turned his camera on. He's trying to be stealth about it. He's, been, um, he's like, What's Kerry got to share? <laughs> That's all good. Um, I just want to remind everybody, and, and I'm not sure how many are still coming in or sitting in the waiting room, but I think it's good to kind of kick off. It's not. I'm not going to get too far into anything that anybody's going to miss that much. Um, and I think it would be really good just to remind people that if they haven't printed off the handout yeah. or they haven't, you know, got a copy of it on their computer or iPad or whatever, something that you can kind of annotate or at least see it and make your notes because I'm going to help you unpack um, these different aspects of self as we go through. And um, for anybody like Rich or other people who might have actually read my book, The Trouble with Trauma, I talk about this system, but I don't take you in the book, I don't take you into the detail that I'm going to take you into tonight to help you unpack and understand your own system. So that's the main part the gist of what we're what we're going to do and you know because it is I just do me um I have got a powerpoint ready to go and I'm going to talk you through a certain to a certain point and then I'm going to kind of leave the image up while we talk through the different aspects of self and at that point I'm going to ask you all to kind of you know feel free to turn your mics back on and and you know ask questions and have discussions and you know I'm not sure who's got control of breakouts, if there was enough people and, and you know, yeah. we needed to, we could have gone into breakout rooms. But it'll just help to talk it through some of the sort of things that you kind of think you might have a handle on on what it is that I'm trying to allude to. But if you're not sure, just always ask the question because I always say to people in, in workshops, it's like the one question that, you know, you're sitting there going, oh, will I or won't I? Somebody else is thinking the same question, so it's always just a good way to ask, and off we go. All right. Do you um, You want me to hand over screen share? uh, Yeah, and maybe just um, as as you do that, um, we can just kind of close our eyes for a minute and just sort of drop in and bring, bring our full attention in just on the information that we're going to discuss and share. And I just personally want to thank everybody for being here. It's a lovely summer evening, a bit warm, but I really look forward to kind of taking you down this path and on the journey and just ask you to notice any of those kind of little thoughts or niggles or things that you're thinking you've got to kind of attend to and not be fully present. Just let them go and just knowing that the wisdom that you get from tonight is what it is that you need for yourself. Big deep breath. Awesome. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's rock and roll. Oh, it still tells me I'm disabled from screen sharing, which... Um, so, you try now? hey, try now. Now, cool. 
All right. So just bear with me two seconds while I pull up. Don't look at my screen, my background screen. Everybody freaks out. How many windows do you have open, woman? And I'm like, it's okay. It's all good. All right. So we're going to talk one, about one thing, Kerry, as now your host, can you also keep just quickly the participants window open? Because anyone knocking at the door uh, in see participants, bottom left-hand side of the very yeah. bottom of the Zoom, far left yes, is yes, 11. Yes. Yeah, keep it open on your screen because anyone knocking at the door to come in, will it's you now that will let them in. Okay. So, and you'll only know that. If um so down the very bottom of Zoom, the, the click on the participants at the bottom of your Yeah, Zoom. I've got it. It's it's I just let another one in, so that's all good. Yeah, I will keep popping up. Yep. Okay. okay. I will keep that open and keep trying to be on top of it. Cool. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about mastering your mindset. And um I'm I'm just gonna give you a little challenge as we go through my PowerPoint presentation this evening. I might have a theme. And I just give you an idea to maybe look for it. Uh, I can't give you a prezi, but, you know, mm. hey, gold star to the person who picks it. And if you don't pick it, I'd be very surprised. Mm. <laughs> All right. Now, you know the problem I am going to have here is that I now have multiple things floating above my presentation and <laughs> I've got to move them around while I work out what it is I'm talking about. But anyway. We talk about one in five Australians is the statistic that we used to talk about mental health prior to the pandemic. So we used to say one in five Australians suffered from some level of mental health issue at some point in their lives. And then, you know, that was a yearly statistic that about 20% would be having difficulty at some point. During the pandemic, it went up to four in five Australians were identifying that they were having a bit of a problem. And what we noticed, and I was even listening on the news this afternoon, that um, mental health is something that we talk about much, much more in the broader community. We're, we're much more aware of it. We've got now um, sort of several generations, well, two generations really, who are very self-aware of their mental health challenges and some of the difficulties that we face, which is fantastic. The problem is that, you know, we haven't necessarily developed a system behind it that actually helps to support it in everyday living and within the community. We can talk about it, we can have empathy for it, but we often don't necessarily understand how to master our own mindset. And one of the things that I think is really important when we talk about mental health in general is actually understanding that your mindset is something that you need to learn to make your best friend because most of the problems that we have are because we actually end up being self-critical and causing the biggest negative kind of issues basically by attacking self. And so what we want to do is develop much greater awareness of self, get much more clearer around our different aspects of self, which are the 12 parts that I'm going to take you into tonight, and then I'm going to show you how it is that you learn to understand and manage that system because essentially we are a system of parts. So then you're hearing that audio, are you, Kerry? No, can't no. hear the audio. No audio. It Ah. In the settings, you have to um, share sound. Yeah. Um, I realise I didn't do that last time, and I'm just trying to remember where it is. Oh, that's all right. In the other way to do it. It could be before you share your screen. Oh, mm -hmm. here, share computer sound. Yes. Yep. yep. Okay, let's try that again and see if it works. And if it just hand up at me, if it's not. Brain's health is just as hey, well, yeah. important as the rest of your body. To be able to train it like a muscle. I know the brain's not a muscle, but to be able to train it just as much as, just as much as we focus on our physical health. Right. So should we focus, be focused on our mental health? The two are not separate. We know this. They are intrinsically linked. But across society, across the world with stigma and everything else that's attached to it, mental health kind of gets left behind, but it's also the invisible injury. And the things that we can't see and the things that we don't understand scare us. Um, and 
And it's hard to be able to, to talk about something that perhaps a lot of people don't feel. All right. So I use Prince Harry as a good demonstration of understanding mental health and understanding mental health at a level that in society we don't tend to talk about. And what he talks about is training your brain. And I developed a program called the Mental Muscle Method. And the reason that I did that was because I was in the gym at the time and I was very aware that in order to go through this build-up process in the gym, I couldn't just go to the gym once and expect that my body was now perfect and fit and I could do anything I wanted with it, right? And yet in a lot of workplaces and in different parts of society, we might go and see a counsellor once or we'll, you know, go and attend a mental health first aid course and we think that that's it. We've kind of, oh, that's all we needed. We just needed some awareness. But no, in reality, what we need is some ways to understand how to build resilience, how to build self-awareness, and then what can we do to help ourselves in the process? When we recognise that there's a problem, how do we actually make it, you know, better? And what can we do to help ourselves to make it better? So I talk about this kind of idea about mental fitness, and what I'm going to throw out to you is I was thinking about whether or not we might be able to factor in a bit of a 12-week check through our normal clan groups just in terms of being able to have a check-in around the elements of the mental fitness that I'm going to talk to you about just at a really high level and whether or not that's something that we could potentially throw in as a little reference theme along the way to try and have this idea that over a three-month period we're going to make greater self-awareness, a real focus, and how we factor it into different aspects of our lives and noticing maybe when things kind of run off the rails, but what are you able to do using this system to help bring you back into alignment and then, you know, what's the benefit of that? Because like anything, when you first start out doing something, it feels hard and difficult and challenging. When I was first in the gym, the idea of even getting a kettlebell swing right or moving the weight up would never have ever occurred to me and I would not have thought I could do it. But then as I did it, I was able to perfect the technique, move up to greater weights and do things that I never kind of anticipated I could do, right? So that's the same thing I want you to think about. It's just a matter of reminding yourself about how we do that. So who recognises this image? Anybody? It's actually from a mini series um, that some of you, of the, well, some of you may have seen, but not very many people did see, but um, it was called the United States of Tara. Yeah, and it was actually right. about this woman who had multiple personality. But one of the things as I went through it, she had all of these different parts and it kind of made this idea of parts of self more um, acceptable in a way. The way they portrayed it on screen was actually quite um, almost accepting, Uh, but it used to frustrate me that show because what they used to talk about is the reason that she had the trauma that separated and could produce these parts was never, ever possibly what the trauma was, right? And so I used to get annoyed about the clinical background of it because it wasn't quite right. But the reality is that we all have parts of self. And so I talk about that. Like, you know, I said earlier, when I'm presenting, it's kind of like, well, I've got to put the lipstick on and do my hair and whatever. Why? Because then the part of me that is able to sit here and talk to you about those things is actually in the driver's seat of my life. And I talk about the fact that we want to think about how we drive, how we get around from one point to another, that we, you know, some of us, your 12 parts are like you're in a minibus and you're the driver and often what happens is the reason that you feel like you can't get where you want to go is because the person who knows how to drive is not the one in the driver's seat. (laughs) And so if you've got the four-year-old in the driver's seat, they can't reach the pedals, they can't see over the steering wheel, they don't know where they're going, they can't read the map. So The other part of all of this is that there's also an idea that if you want to get somewhere, you actually have to know where you want to go because Mm -hmm. if you don't actually set a plan for the end point, and I want you to think about that, it's not just about, you know, turn left or right here, but if you know you want to get to a certain place, 
you can get there in a multitude of ways. But if you have nowhere that you're aiming for, then every turn ends up being left or right, whatever you feel at that point in time. Sometimes we can get really lost and then we can end up going back around on ourselves all the time. So that's the bit that I just want you to kind of think about having a a direction and a place to go, even if it's only a short term one, it still helps to move that momentum forward. Now, I want to talk to you about how our parental relationships really influence the development of this system. So you need to think back to how it was, what you were like as a child and how this impacted in terms of how you related to your own parents. And I just want you to kind of have a look at when we talk about the wording on the screen, I talk about the sense that we have dependent relationships and independent relationships. So dependent relationships are sometimes what people will call codependency. There's a level of feeling responsible, that there's responsibility around how your parents feel. Um, So when you go to them with a problem potentially in your teens or even when you were young, what you would often hear back is things like, you know, instead of being given the validity for how difficult something was, you might often get the, oh, well, you know, what do you think it was like for me? And so we don't, we don't get a sense of affirmation from parents in this situation. They often turn the situation around to be more about how that affects them. So if uh, if you were upset about something and you went to a parent and there was this dependent responsibility, often you get to a point where you stop actually telling them about the things that happen because you have this ingrained sense that it doesn't matter what you do or say, Um, you're not going to get any sort of validation for the position that you're in because everything turns around to how it affects the parent. Mm -hmm. So it's a really important point to come to because there's this inverse relationship that develops from that kind of parental relationship. And that is this sense that you as the child are responsible for your parents' feelings. You as the child are responsible for your parents' happiness. And this is, we often see it too in certain uh, cultures. We'll see it a lot in like Eastern European cultures um, where there's this sense of, you know, your success is a reflection on on your parents. Um, your ability to, to succeed is something that they're hanging on to as some sort of, you know, credibility for themselves. And if you don't give them that sense of something to, you know, crow about that, you know, that you're of no consequence, right? So it's a really, it's a very damaging way to parent, but it is a very common um, outcome of some of these sort of societies that didn't have a great awareness, I want to say, of this emotional kind of responsibility and ties. And so we see a lot of it, especially out of the Second World War, there was a big, um, you know, big sort of shift to, um actually the other way, which is more independent. Like there was a sense of abandonment and disconnect. And so then we end up with this whole generation who were quite, you know, we you got nothing to complain about because you didn't experience the war like I did kind of stuff. So, Mm. And we see this intergenerationally all the time as we grow up, as we go through life, we see these historic changes that happen in our community then having a flow-on effect to the way that we parent and the next generation changes as a result. And then, you know, we kind of hopefully evolve for the better, <laughs> but sometimes it seems like we take a bit of a step backwards. So having a look then at independent parenting. So there's a level of a sense of being inconsequential to your parent. Parents make you feel like you're a hassle or you're annoying them or you're bothering them. You know, I can't stop right now. I'm busy, you know, come back later there's also often a sense of there being no responsibility and I say to people quite openly I grew up in a very independent kind of relationship with my my mother because I'm the youngest of five and it was a sole parent household my dad left when I was a baby and quite frankly she just really didn't have time she had five kids and a lot of stuff going on and Mm. you know trying to manage her own stuff um, was you know challenging enough let alone being able to provide some level of, you know, what I want to say, appropriate or effective kind of um, emotional stability. So somewhere between the dependent and the independent is ideally where we need to be. We need to um, recognise our children have 
needs and need to be validated in their experience and we need to give them things to strive to enable them to learn to become independent at an appropriate age. If they become independent too early, then, you know, they have a sense of being abandoned and they don't also then learn to form appropriate relationships. So we can see here in dependency, we get enmeshed relationships and in independency, we get um, people who are actually avoidant of connection. And so, you know, that abandonment plays out in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so it's important just to recognise it because we're all on, on the continuum between one end or another based on what we've experienced in our own childhood. And then what we've tried to do normally, what we do then as parents is we try to do the opposite of what happened with us. <laughs> it's almost a natural progression. It's yes. like this rite of passage. Oh, I'm not going to do that. So then I go the extreme opposite and sometimes we end up with the polar opposite problem. So yeah. one of the things to just sort of keep in mind, how do we balance it? All right. Is so, any, just quickly, is there anyone, anyone else at the door? Uh, nobody else at the door. I've let a couple of people in. Yep, just that's all. And you're just checking that because I... Uh, yeah, yeah, it pops up on the screen to admit them, so I'm admitting Love them. Love it. Thank you. So we uh, talk about that difference, and you can see here the difference on the screen, this sort of sense of mum, you know, comforting the girl, but also giving her this sense of, you know, this emotional kind of connection, but that the emotional connection you can see from the look on the girl's face, she's kind of like, I'm not sure if this is okay to have this emotional sort of thing. This is, you know, I have to look out for mum's emotional response here. And then, you know, the little boy at the bottom on the mobile phone by himself with his basketball, there's nobody there, nobody's, you know. And I say to people, um, I remember multiple times being left after school, just like forgotten about, <laughs> you just sort of think that happens. And, you know, it used to happen a lot more, I think, when we were younger. Um, but as a result, that never happened with my kids. It was one of the things I was absolutely paranoid about. And I think it's one of those things we have to recognise that we learn as we kind of grow up. We try and make things better in one way or another. Yeah. On the flip side of that, I think that then what we did is my generation then raised a generation of children who weren't as open to taking risk because yeah. they weren't allowed to be out in the parks and doing all sorts of stuff and up to the shop on their own and all that sort of stuff because we were all a bit paranoid about what would happen to them. So then we, you know, recognise that that parenting raises within itself these different elements of self. And so we have what I call our child and protector parts. So when we get emotional about anything, what we do is we revert into either our child parts who are looking for connection or feeling rejected and sad about it, or our protector parts who tend to get angry or protective and tend to be rejecting of others for that protection mechanism. So depending on which way we go has an awful lot to do with whether or not we grew up enmeshed or whether we grew up independent. Mm. For most people, if they're enmeshed, when they get upset, they go straight into child mode first. They might get angry and protector part comes out later, but they usually get upset first. Whereas independent people who have grown up independent tend to go into that protector mode first and then go into that sort of child mode, but it's done very much in isolation. It's all done by themselves, whereas the child part in somebody who's in mesh tends to come out and look for the connection, crying, you know, I want the connection, please don't leave me, is there anything I can do? Whereas the protector elements tend to kind of go, you know, you don't want to hang out with me, fine, rack off, I don't want you anyway. Um, you know, back off, you're crowding me, get out of my space. You know, one of my favourites, well, if you don't like it, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I say this openly, right? It's been one of those things I've always been, I would say, quite fiercely independent. And so, and and that's actually had some, you know, negative consequences, I would say, in some of my interpersonal relationships because um, it's been one of those things that I'm much more inclined to kind of go, okay, bye, um, than I am to, you know, try and work my way through something. As I've got older, I've got much better at it. The more therapy I did for others, I got even better at it. <laughs> 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 it's just one of those things. 
So recognising that we have these child and protector parts, when we get triggered emotionally, that's why you'll see people crying or sad or angry and, you know, either extreme. And we usually go, depending on which way we go, we go one way first, then we flip into the other and back again until we can kind of bring the arousal back down. So when we, that's actually a helpful thing to understand, right? Because it means that whenever we get an emotional response and it may Mm. not be a full on one, but, and I notice this now, I'm much more aware and I can recognize the trigger, I kind of go, oh, that's made me feel like I'm, I want to have a go about something or I want to just walk away and I'm in my mind, I'm whatever in this person. And I'm much better now at being able to pick up on that and kind of go, huh, what did that person just say that made me feel like I couldn't care less, like, you know, that I just want to abandon. I just want to hit the ejector seat and get away from that situation write off whatever thing they were saying is not important or invalid to me um, because I really don't want to listen. Um, And I've learned to catch it at that point. So one of the things that I talk about a lot is the greatest teacher is our own self-awareness. And as we build more self-awareness, you're not going to get it perfect from the beginning. Go back to the analogy about being in the gym. You've got to work on your form. You've then got to practice. Then you can increase the weight. You don't just go rushing in to do a deadlift straight off with, you know, your body weight. You can't do it. You need to take those steps and actively make the decision that you're going to learn how to better manage your reactivities, like your your reactive systems. Being aware of it is the first part of it. Then having a system to be able to label it and move between parts and be able to manage your own arousal is what we're going to go through tonight. And I'm going to teach you how to do it. Awesome. So understanding that we have external, like our internalizers and our externalizers is also the other part of it. So depending on how we kind of have this reactivity, we can be sad and withdrawn, but we can kind of tend to internalize all of that into ourselves. Whereas when we tend to be more uh, protector mode, we might observe that it seems to be more external where we're attacking others. But like all things, we also have the inverse as well. So we can have this externally, um, like we would think an angry protector reactive part, but it's passive aggressive. We don't say anything. We just whatever that person and we walk away. We don't actually have this external big explosion or, or interaction. We hold it all in. And depending on a range of situations, we can learn how to do that over time because anybody who's been in a volatile relationship learns not to express that because if you express it, it always goes badly. So sometimes we learn how to passively hold that information in. And on the other side, sometimes we can um, have the the child part that feels like, you know, we've, we've internal, I'm just going to keep withdrawn and alone because nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I think I'm going to go and eat worms and you'll cry alone in your room. Or you can go seeking out people close to you and, and approaching them in that sad childlike way because you're looking for that nurturing connection, which is an external version of that child part that's still in that child mode and feeling like you need nurturing. But instead of staying withdrawn and internal, you still go external and, and seek that reconnection. So you'll see what I mean by that as we go through the 12 parts because they actually move around and you'll see that difference between the internalizing view and the externalizing view. So in psychology, we talk about this as the locus of control. So how we control the outcome in our lives versus any external forces that are beyond our control. So there's this kind of like, what we, what we feel we can manage ourselves and then what we feel we can't and is outside of us. And so depending on how we were raised, it's easier to, um, if things are outside of our control, to push them away and make them not us and we just keep the things internally like that, that are within our control that we can manage. And depending on how we were raised, we learn to have that point of that transition of that locus con- of control some people have it all internal and other people have very little internal and it's all external. So it's another area that feels like it's this sort of variability and, and 
I want to say, on a level of a spectrum or some sort of gradient. Yes. So this is our framework for managing our emotional responsiveness. And I want you to think about it like I always say to people, when you first, when people would come into therapy first up, I would say to them, you can see by this diagram that there's all this emotional stuff, all the red. And yeah. the idea and the goal of therapy, quite frankly, is to reduce all of that emotional redness back into a very small component just at each end of that child protector part because it's a natural responsiveness. But what we want to try and do is feel that we don't get triggered anywhere near as much and feel that we have much more responsibility and onus of control over how we can react and that feels more positive to how we manage our lives. Now, what I talk about at the bottom is numbing avoidance. And this is something that we all have we usually have the things that we go to that help us to avoid our feelings now you know for most people these are some level of addiction and addiction is a funny thing it can look really weird for some of us it's work work's a really good addiction right it's a good avoidance mechanism it's something that you can focus on when you feel like the rest of your life is a little bit out of control I'll just work more and I, I, I'm always too busy because I'm, I'm working. But others, you know, we eat too much, we drink too much, we, you know, go shopping online all the time. We, you know, that's how we, porn addictions, you name it. There's all sorts of different ways that we can trigger our mind into this dopamine response that helps us to avoid our emotional feelings. So it's a sense of, I want you to think about it as this is the place where we tread water. So the goal of therapy really is to reduce this diamond from this even-sided thing to more of a triangle where we do almost no numbing avoidance. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, that we can't have any vices. I mean, come on, everybody gets a good, you know, hit the dopamine from the Amazon purchase, right, and the parcel turns up at the door, you know. But The idea behind all of this is to try and flatten this out so that what we end up with is a really great kind of, and I want to say pyramid, towards the rational, that we have much greater self-awareness and we can keep ourselves in our rational adult thinking mind the majority of the time. And our rational adult parts are made up of our three main adult drivers. First is our working part, but it's our rational kind of, you know, clear thinking, moving forward, working part, clear problem solving, all of that moving forward. The other mm-hmm. part on the child side is our socialite part, the part that keeps us connected to our community, to our friends, to our family, that allows us to have that time. And then the final one is what I call our seeker. And the seeker is the part that looks the answers to any problems that we have in our lives. The seeker is the part that brought you to this webinar tonight so that you could have a look at what we were talking about because you want to learn how to master your mindset. That is your seeker part. Your seeker part always is looking for how do I learn better and how do I solve my own problems? And the seeker often because, you know, we are humans and we like connection, will sometimes go looking for answers to problems for the people that we love as well, depending on how active your seeker is at problem solving like mine. And sometimes the seeker likes to filter into the avoidance by focusing on solving everybody else's problems instead of solving your own. So it's just one of those things to keep in mind. We've got to keep a healthy balance. All right. Now I'm going to take you through this system into a little bit more detail later, but I want you to just think about who you think you might be, and now might be a good time if people are prepared to share. I've said to you that um, I am very much um, the sort of internalizer because I take full responsibility for my emotional reactivity. I don't put it on other people. So when I get that reactive response, I tend to be more passive aggressive and I will withdraw. I'll still be angry. I'll usually say, I might say a few things, but I'm not overt about it. I don't tend to, you know, yell at others unless somebody's yelling at me. Um, But I don't tend to kind of go to that as my first point of defence. I tend to go more into protector mode first. 
So I don't know how everybody feels, but I don't know if anybody wants to, if, if they want to have a chat or you're not sure maybe about whether you, which way you go, then now might be a good time to just check in about uh, what you're thinking or yeah, if right. you're happy to share it or not. And maybe we could invite the people that are on the call but have they got their videos up. It would be really lovely to, if you can, chuck them on um, just so we can, I think, Valentine, Yatin, you seem like you're here. It is nice yeah. to see people's faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of, some of you may be from out of the community, so you won't be as familiar, but um, and you, you would have got the message to come in and experience tonight with Carrie. Ah, uh, Yatin. So, so you're very welcome. Um, but if you can switch your cameras on, it'll be really, really good. Um, yeah. So you want you're going to open up that question, Kerry? Yeah, just if anybody wants to share it, or if anybody's not sure and they want to check on something, what you think? Yeah. I'm just going to Kerry, I'm back. wondering, does it have anything to do with our tendencies to introversion or extroversion? Um. It can do, but it, it just you, it's not necessarily that directly related. Yeah. It usually it usually has to do with you know some people and you'll know the people I'm talking about, you know, how some people just they get angry and they just start yelling. Or there's other people that get angry and you never know that they're angry, but they just disappear. Mm. And it's that kind of, you know, are you the person who tends to just withdraw and disappear? because sometimes that feels like it's a safer way to manage things um, or, you know, do you do you tend to yell? And it's really interesting because on the whole, I'm just, I'm personally, I have learned over years too, I don't see any benefit in, in yelling because it just doesn't get you anywhere and you can't be heard anyway. Mm. The only person I ever get into any kind of yelling with is, is my eldest daughter who tends to yell at me first. <laughs> and so what happens then, and it's really interesting because it's a fantastic observation on my part, because what happens is my dominant protector part then comes out <laughs> and puts her in her place mm -hmm. because she is not the person who gets to yell at me. I don't disrespect her that way. I do not expect to be disrespected like that. And so you can kind of see, but even in doing that, I can still be quite like, passive like I'm really on it but usually it's like right to the nail and I'm just like don't you dare like I don't tend to get into that sort of big externalized yelling bit I tend to internalize it still mm. it was, well, I'll share yeah. very openly um I'm a yeller and that's just become and that was just from what had happened to me the way that my past had taught me but I've got two amazing teachers that just bring it to my awareness and it's like, Mum, you're raising your voice. So I stop. And, yep. um, you know, Mum, you're raising your voice. I don't like you talking to me like that. Can you stop? And it was like, okay, cool, I'll stop. And yep. then we have a, and we have a safe word and we just go, Doo, and then it's done. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's where it's – but I – the work that I have done, I understand why I was that way in because of yep. the way that my parents and their parents and their parents yeah. behave. Yeah. yeah. And it is like that, right? It is the stuff we always say, children learn what they live. So it's great that you're trying to put in a different way so that they can learn something different right and it's a really important point and I think it's also really good when I talk to people about conflict resolution one of the things that I do say to them is try and find a word that is neutral that you can kind of go hey because sometimes when you get into this escalating stuff and you have the same kind of conflict triggers all the time it's because that person says the same words every time mm -hmm. you say this they say that and it's kind of like oh, your brain knows where this is going. And we just play out this whole thing yeah, before it's even had a <laughs> chance to actually get there. Yeah. Your brain goes, oh, I know where this is going to end up. So it goes there, there, and you're already, you know, down the road. Yeah. So say and to people. It's, just, it's like a pause button. Yeah, it is. So it's like, so now it's like Jackson and Saffron or even I, it's like we'll just go pineapple. It, just, it doesn't mean anything to anyone. No. But it's just this pattern interrupt because I've, I mean, I've always taught, and interrupts yeah and, it, and, and it's not that and you're it's a, a good bad, one 
and it's not a bad human that you're actually you've you've gone tilted to that side it's just the fact that you weren't aware that you tilted and yeah. just honor and accept it and it's like you know I mean because I can then look at where we where I was in other relationships around my lifetime yeah and and I think it's a good pattern it's a good pattern to show them too that you're learning as an adult that you're not yes. perfect massively oh, God, yeah. <laughs> we have to this yeah. is, that's we have to and that's, that's a... the biggest thing we have to learn it's like we have, and it doesn't matter if you're a teacher a parent if you're, even if you're not a parent just mm. as a human you just have to be able to do it mm. so yeah. oh you must be doing you mustn't be doing too bad <laughs> Kerry is it contextualized because I'm you know in, a, in my intimate relationship at home in the family unit I I, I reckon I I grew up with quite a lot of um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of things there was a lot of um, unsecurity there was a lot of uh, violence instability um, I probably moved house maybe seven times you know before by the age of seven multiple split scenarios I had a period in foster home I had a period you know unofficial foster home so I developed I don't know like can you develop both sides and so I noticed in my business life managing teams and being a leader, being a rock star and a singer and being that person, I'll tend to go more into um, when conflict arises in those spaces. I'll go into that protector mode. It'll be more quiet. It'll be more, more like um, this kind of part of me goes, well, you know what, I'm, I'm capable of absolutely anything by sheer force and will and sort of, you know, if you guys and I'll just make it happen. But in the home environment, i um, it's more around that connection and can we calm it down? Can yeah. we work it out? How can I create safety faster? But then you you transplant me into the business and I'm a, I'm a different beast, you know? So, so as we go through the different aspects of self, you'll see that that's actually entirely normal, Rich, right? Yeah. Because you've got this quite volatile sort of background that was completely unsafe. But yeah. then what you've done is develop this very strong persona, this strong protector part, because, you know, I'm I'm much the same for different reasons. But, um, yeah, there, there is that, you know, capable top level. But it feels like I want, to th I want you to think about it like it's this Darth Vader costume that you put on when you go mm. out and you're doing the rock star thing, right, mm. that it's this sense of power and authority and capability that you're able to just, you know, take with you when you put that kind of business-oriented person in the driver's seat of your life. Mm. When you're at home, right, you're supposed to be able to take that mask off and costume off and actually, you know, let let it hang out a bit more. And mm. so the approach is going to be quite different and often more vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah? Yeah. All right. So I will keep going. I'll make oh, you host again. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Give me. I think Zoom's taking a second to catch up. Um. Yeah. All right. So try here and here we go. So, um, I want you to think about the fact that the true ego-driven force in your life is actually your inner four-year-old. And I will explain <laughs> why this is the case. And your inner protector parts don't like the idea that the four-year-old is actually truly the one that's in control. Um, but there's good reasons why we need mm -hmm. your ultimate protector and your inner four-year-old to become the best of friends. And I'm going to tell you that for most people right now, they don't like each other at all. Um, unless you've done a lot of work. If you've done a lot of work, they might be more familiar with each other. They might mm. be tolerating each other, um, but they usually don't like each other very much. Now, I use this image because I like talking about protector parts. My protector part, absolutely, Zena Warrior Zena. Princess. <laughs> right. Yes, Lee, absolutely, you know this troop. So... Uh. I am the person who, when my protector comes out, and this used to happen a lot more when I was younger, it would be like pull the broadsword out, chop the head off and ask questions later. Um, but I've learned much more over time that 
what I need to do is feel that I'm battle ready, but just stop and catch my breath and try and work out why I feel like I want to chop this person's head off before I actually get my broadsword out and do it anyway. And then over time, I've learned much more to acknowledge that Zena wants to get in here and rip this person's head off. Okay. And I'll, I, I can actually rationally observe her and kind of go, hmm, all right, the big guns are out. What happened? So that I can work out what it is and I can temper that kind of reaction before I actually launch into, you know, full attack mode. Now, it's an important thing to learn what your protector looks like. Because as I said, I'm a bit more of an internalizer, doesn't mean I don't take action. So my action though is usually pretty hard and blunt. And what I mean by that is the action is if I was in full flight, it'd be like protection mode is just no negotiation, cut straight to the chase and cut it off usually and, and done with it and walk away. And that of course is quite harsh, right? <laughs> and so it doesn't matter how that's presented. If you hit the ejector seat in any kind of relationship, whether they're intimate relationships, business relationships, whatever, it's it's not the first time that, you know, somebody, you know, will present something to me and it's just like, no, you know, and then they might kind of come back and, and push something and I will just cut it. I won't even be bothered. And my brain is immediately thinking about the fact. So I'm moving overseas, right? I'm trying to get rid of stuff and, I had something on Facebook last night for 60 bucks and somebody came back and said, I'll give you 20 bucks. And I went, no. And they came back and said, yes. And I blocked them and I reported them for making an unreasonable offer. And I closed the whole conversation down. Right. And why do I do that? Because I can't be bothered with this stupid idiot person who isn't actually being even fair and reasonable. And I'm not going to waste my time trying to negotiate or talk to them. They're an inconsequential, you know, and they just get cut off. Mm. And so understanding that element of self <laughs> is really important <laughs> yes. because when we first start to understand this, the protector part usually really has a, a hate relationship with the four-year-old child within us. The protector part, your protector part is usually your most critical internal part as well. So they will turn and attack others, but they will actually turn and attack you, right? Yeah. And so the the part that attacks you doesn't tend to sound like Zena, Zena in my case. It sounds like my mother or it sounds like my father. Whoever was the more critical parent, it sounds like them. It sounds like all the negativity that they were telling me when I was little about why I'm not good enough or not up to scratch or all of that stuff. And so yeah. we need to recognise that. Because when the protector turns internal and starts to attack, the way to manage that is recognising that this is mum or dad and we kind of go, oh, yeah, good one, mum. That's not going to help me right now, right, mm. because I really don't need to turn and attack the system. The thing that triggered all of this is external to me, not internal, and this isn't really helping me get anywhere. Mm. So we can kind of stop that internal critical dialogue and cut it off over time, you can cut it off altogether because that part doesn't help you and doesn't actually belong in your own head. If you think about it, that part of self is usually doesn't belong to you. It's the parent. And so recognizing it's the parent and, and externalizing it really helps to limit the influence that it has over your life. So Carrie, so, I've got a quick question. Yeah. Yeah. Really? So how do you externalize mine? So my character is He-Man. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so I would love you to elaborate on that. So you do externalise yours always. There is no critical part that turns on yourself. Okay. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm asking you. As a four-year-old me, you know, I, oh, yeah. I remember loving, well, He-Man was my warrior. Yes. And... I don't know how you would, because I came from a very good upbringing. I'm very fortunate. So 
the fact so, that He-Man was the person that you admired the most when you were four, because four-year-olds all develop hero worship elements. It's a normal part of our development, right? So mm-hmm. there was something yeah. about He-Man in the way that he presented himself that was something that you would have felt that you needed. Yeah. So yeah. do you remember what it was about He-Man specifically? And excuse me while I just stand up because I have to go from standing to sitting because I just had yeah. those kind of injuries. So <laughs> can you remember what it was, Lee, about He-Man that you really admired the most? Uh, yeah, because he was a protector of the universe. There you go. Mm. So did you just think he was an all-round good bloke that he looked after everybody else or was it his strength in doing that that you really admired? Uh, I think both. Okay. Mm. And in terms of your adult protector part, do you think that you still emulate that persona? Um, in, uh, in little bits now. Mm. Okay. So if you, and and I might, if you're okay with this, I might park it because I think when we go through the next part of it, you'll understand a bit more. You might be able to answer this bit yourself. Okay, cool. All right. I test the question. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's actually a really good one because I think we all, as children, <laughs> we all had um, characters or, or elements that we kind of admired and felt that we wanted to emulate. And yeah. usually there's something about them that you were really looking for. Um, one of the things that um, I think when I think about some of the kind of characters or things that I used to look to when I was younger, um, I always wanted to be invisible. And when you think about you think mm-hmm. about why I wanted to be invisible, it's kind of like sometimes there'd be this chaos and I just wanted to be invisible, right? I didn't want to be in yeah, this yeah. situation, this chaotic environment. Um, and so we kind of just need to start to reflect back on some of that. But on the flip side, I always had this thing about Wonder Woman because, you know, she was amazing. Um, mm. And, you know, I have a couple of different ones that I think about then. And the one that stayed with me the most is actually Lady Penelope of the Thunderbirds because <laughs> <laughs> she had a, a pink, he had a pink Mercedes convertible that yeah. had guns out the out That's the tailpipes. Right. She had a video <laughs> camera in her car and she had the driver called Parker and she had a lipstick compact that was a telephone and she was an independent woman, independently wealthy woman who uh, could go wherever she wanted to. She was beautiful and she, you know, didn't need any men at all. I think that just sounds perfect. It's probably, you know, I might have emulated that a little bit more than I intended to. But my uh, business partner in Turkey, when he drives me around, I say, thank you, Parker. (laughs) Okay. So one of the things I want you to understand about how do we come to a resolution of the system and the key to resolving our internal conflict is actually about developing some coexistence between our parts, yes. co-awareness, yes. the ability to actually understand our internal parts and recognise why they're there. And instead of detesting them for being there, understanding why they turned up and then trying to rationalise within ourselves with our normal, rational adult self how to mediate between these two emotionally charged parts. And when we do this for ourselves, we get better and better at it as we go. And the reason that we have to do this is because we keep having this idea about what we took from our childhood was this sense of never really, like you just want to be loved unconditionally. The child just really desperately wants to know that they're loved. And the problem that we have is that no matter how good they were, we do not ever get unconditional love from our parents. Because mm. it, we're actually even as humans, and, and this is hard, a lot of people struggle with this, right? But it's not possible to truly love another human unconditionally. The only people who love you unconditionally are the dogs, right? They're <laughs> the ones who love you 
lavish everything on you no matter what happens, but they don't withhold their love. They don't withhold any care or, or that connection. They really are capable of just, you know, being so excited to see you. And and I think it's got to do with their memory, to be honest. But we have much longer memories and we hold on to these things. And, you know, there's always little grudges and different things. And even as a parent, you know, I can love my my children truly and I do. I love them truly. And I love them with all I have, but it's not unconditional. Yeah. yeah. And it can't really be unconditional. No. Okay. Mm. So this is the part that's really like sometimes hard, but the bit that we need to understand because there is one person actually who can love you unconditionally, and that is yourself. That's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's the okay. only person who will ever <laughs> love you yes. unconditionally. That's right. Okay? So it's an important part of how do we really come to the point where we love and accept everything about who we are. Now, as we go through this, you'll probably say to me, oh, yeah, you know, I've done a lot of work and I'm pretty good at loving and accepting myself, but I can guarantee you that there are parts within you that really don't like each other very much. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that is the part that whoever gets mad at the part that actually gives in to the addiction Do you know those ones? Like when I decide that I've come back from overseas and I've put on like 10 kilos and I want to get it off and I go on this whole journey of cutting everything out and then at 11 o'clock find myself in the pantry, uh, you know, scoffing two rows of chocolate before I go to bed, which is, of course, the worst time to do it. (laughs) And then I could at that point self-flagellate for, you know, the next 10 days, throw their baby out of the bathwater and go, that's it. I'm not going to watch anything that I eat because there's no point. Or I could kind of go, hmm, obviously something emotional happened in that moment that made me feel like I really needed some sugar right now. And, you know, chocolate has a natural cannabinoid in it that makes us feel loved. Who knows what was going on? But rather than actually beating myself up about it, I just have learned to kind of go, oh, okay, well, that happened. It was two rows. It wasn't the whole block. Okay. That's it, go to bed and get on with it tomorrow and, you know, just get back on the horse because otherwise mm. if we throw the baby out with the bathwater before I know it, 10 kilos would be 20 and then nothing will have resolved at all. Yeah. So we've learned to do that because I had much better relationships with my addiction parts, the parts that we use to numb, the parts that we use to avoid our different feelings, the parts are... Uh, For some people, you know, I want you to just think about the things that you go to because these are some, for some people they seem hard, but I find they're the easiest place to start. I want you to think about what are the three things that you do that feel like they're things that they're either naughty or you get angry at yourself for doing them, even if nobody else knows that you're doing them, right, or they cause you some sort of, pain and it might be emotional pain or physical pain or or financial pain or but there's there's usually three some people have more some people struggle to work out what but you know it could be sleep some people feel like they sleep too much that they don't use the most of their time whatever some people shop too much online Some people, even when they try and set a budget, they blow it all the time. Some people, you know, promise themselves they're not going to go and buy crappy food and then they get takeaway three, four times a week and, you know, beat themselves up about that. So Mm. I want you to just think about the three main things, right? If anybody's struggling to find three, I can probably help you. But I want you to think about, just write them down on your sheet at the bottom there where it says, um, how how it helps now when we do when we do addictions we think they don't help right the parts that you're thinking about now whatever it is that you do for avoidance you think they don't help at all and you just get angry with yourself about them but I want you to think about actually what it is that they are trying to do so if I think about why am I in the why am I in the pantry with the chocolate well I can I can tap back into some stuff in my childhood where my mother used to, I mean, it was a big family. There wasn't a lot of money. She would hide chocolate in the pantry. 
uh, no, not in the pantry. She would hide it in her bedroom cupboard. And so it was always this sneaky, naughty little thing to steal away into her bedroom and steal the chocolate. So I've done some therapy around this years ago and worked out that that was one of those things that used to get me into chocolate. It doesn't bother me so much anymore. I don't eat nearly as much chocolate as I used to. It's actually quite unusual for me to go to chocolate these days. Um, and often I can leave it in the leave it in the pantry and not touch it for, you know, a month or two. But then sometimes I just have a bit of a spate where I feel like eating chocolate late at night. So hmm. recognising how does it help? Well, back in those days, um, I could never understand why sneaking in and stealing something would make me feel good about anything. But actually it was just this idea of almost that naughty little treat and usually if I got away with it, it gives you this massive dopamine rush. So that was a big thing. It was helping me to, it, it kind of was making me feel good because one, I got something that I wasn't allowed to have and, you know, two, it was, you know, sweet and sugary and all that sort of stuff that I never got to have usually. And it was this almost forbidden fruit. Years later, I recognized that I had a thing with flavored milk. That was a completely different rationale for why I used to go to flavored milk. And I noticed that I would go to flavored milk, particularly when I, I cut it out mostly at home, but then I noticed if I was driving long distances, I would usually stop and get petrol and I'd always go for flavoured milk. And mm. so I did a bit of therapy around that and then discovered that when I was little, because in late primary school, my mum had gone back to work full time and my older brothers had already, they were either at high school and never home or at work or whatever, because there was quite a big gap between me and the other the other kids. And my mum worked in a childcare centre, so she used to bring home the leftover bottles of milk, the 600 mm -hmm. mil bottles of milk. And then because she wanted my brothers to drink it, because they were big, strapping, growing boys, she would buy flavoured topping. And so there was flavoured topping and milk. And I discovered, actually, that when I got scared, so driving alone by myself for long distances used to bring up a little bit of fear. It wasn't a big thing and it wasn't something that I was really acutely aware of. But when I was little, making chocolate milk then made sitting in a house by myself until after dark more bearable because mm. I could avoid the feeling of being scared and being alone if I focused in on this flavoured milk. It was just mm. me and this little kind of experience. Mm. So mm. how did it help yep. me? It helped to make me feel less less scared or afraid. And so it became a comfort thing that I would then go to when I was you know, triggered by it. But in my adulthood, I had no consciousness whatsoever about that. So yeah. sometimes we think that the addiction is something that's causing us harm, but actually the addiction is something that in a really kind of inverse way is making us feel mm. differently about the same situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yes. 100%. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any particular questions about numbing or avoidant parts? Mm. They can, can they, uh, I mean, I've done a little bit of work in and around kind of reply, like identifying what you just said then, yeah? And mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, whenever I would get the flu or a cold when I was younger, when I was with um, with mum you know, or whatever, some reason, um, I think it was because a few times there was dehydration, lack of sugar, and whatever else. But I just think they remember being giving, being given salt and being at a chips and lemonade, uh -huh. and then that persisted through my whole life. Where like, so I'd be sick and I'd have a flu as an adult, and just be like, I got to grab a packet of salt and being at chips and a can of lemonade. But then you know, my wife would say, so. she'd be like, I'm pretty sure like. <laughs> Your, your immune system's down, you're low, that's, that's probably not. So then it was this process of like, how do I flip the script? Yes. Like, can I keep the purpose of the thing, but flip the script? So can I replace the, can I continue to maintain the thing because it's working for me as you just described, right? It's it's a primal inbuilt in my wiring that I needed some particular thing, you know, but can I now as an aware adult flip that into something else and make it, you know, my favourite ginger drink with my whatever, you know. So just this this process of identifying these numbing agents 
recognizing that they play a role and that they are important, but then working out how to flip them into something else. So I do it sometimes with social media. So I'll, I'll go, I'll, you know, I'll sit down because I need it, right? I'm overwhelmed and I'm needing that hit, what you said. You know, there's nothing, my, my, me scrolling is actually me, as you're describing, is me trying to navigate my sense of overwhelm at the time, yeah? Yep. But then my awareness will come up and go, hang on a minute. You're wasting time. You're going into no reason. You're going to feel like shit after this. Can you can you can you still fulfill the need you have right now? But can you replace it with something that is going to be uh, more supportive? So what you're talking about is a very conscious, cognitive decision to make that active replacement, and it's yep. one of those things that we have to do when we can't actually access the kind of therapeutic technique that will add automatically do it for you. Yeah. So conscious awareness is great and it's great to have. Sometimes I say to people, when you develop the conscious awareness, isn't going to automatically make you flip that switch. But no. what we have to do is try and have that rational conversation with ourselves where we have greater awareness at the time when you know that you want salt and vinegar chips and you want lemonade, it's actually closing your eyes and getting in touch with your inner four-year-old little boy who's the one who's sick and wants to feel loved and nurtured and cared yep. about. Yep. And getting salt and vinegar chips and lemonade is what made him feel loved and cared about. But when you can sit with your eyes closed and hold him in your lap and give him a big hug and tell him how much you understand how much pain he's in and how he just wants to be hugged and nurtured and looked after, that he, the salt and vinegar chips and lemonade aren't loved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then all of a sudden your need for it starts to dissipate. Yeah, and becomes subconscious awareness. Yes. Beautiful. And you raise that awareness point up and the more you can hold your inner four-year-old in your lap, and see them and love them and tell them that you understand why they feel the way that they do without being the protector and attacking them for being weak yeah. or pathetic yeah. or whatever, the more strength you build into this self-acceptance and awareness that it's okay, that mm. this is what happens and that this is entirely normal given your experience, right? And the less dependency you then have on needing to fulfill or even replace that need. Yep, beautiful. Right? Powerful. So they're, they're just like, as I said, as you go through this, to start off with the first point is awareness. And being able to reach a point of awareness without self-criticism is like the key because it's usually the self-criticism that we get into that kind of keeps the whole system perpetuating around. So we want to try and develop this self-awareness Get aware that we, okay, ah, oh, so I, oh, here I am already with a face full of salt and vinegar chips and half a bottle of Sprite down my gob. Okay, all right, let me just refocus, reframe, come back in, connect in with the inner child. This isn't love. It's okay to put this away now and it's all yeah. right and we just move on. And the next time it gets easier, the next time you don't go to the shop and get it because you don't need to. You kind of yeah. just, oh, there's that trigger and off we go. Yeah, beautiful. Awesome. Anybody else with anything they want to touch on this point? All right. So I want to take you to your child parts, and the reason for this is because I talked about your four-year-old and your inner four-year-old is the part that we're really kind of tapping into as I want to say your ultimate child part, and they can move, move between, excuse me, the good child if they're trying to reconnect or the alone child when they feel rejected so much so that they just want to withdraw and be alone. And when I talk here in the child state about the baby state, the baby state is that part of you, you know, anybody who's ever experienced a really big sort of difficulty or feeling of abandonment and you're just in bed curled up in a fetal position and you just can't really move or get out of it, that's the kind of baby state that we're talking about. Now, some people will say to me they don't remember ever having that experience, um, you know, 
I can clearly remember certain mm. points yeah. in my early childhood, but even as an adult, you know, where, yeah. um, right. you know, if a, a relationship broke down or, or something that really made me feel like there was a very strong disconnect, um, mm. you know, that sense of feeling like, I mean, I'm so withdrawn and alone, but the only thing I feel that I can do is curl up in a fetal position. This is actually our vagus nerve that actually it's it's the absolute form of self-protection. It's like when the chips are down and things are really difficult, how how am I going to survive? And how I survive is this curling up in the fetal position and just trying to let the world mm. go by and not notice until you feel like you've got some sort of, you know, energy or will to to pull yourself out of it. And it's not something that people experience a lot, but it is something that, you know, can happen when we're in these very sort of extreme emotional situations. So when you think about your child parts, I want you to try and think first, Is can you ever remember a time where you have had that very withdrawn child experience, the most sense of feeling completely abandoned and alone in the world and there's very little function and what I mean by that is there's not really any active movement going on mm. for most people they're almost catatonic in this space right it's it's a sense of very withdrawn and very much a self-nurturing kind of place and mm. for a lot of people they'll think it doesn't really serve any purpose but actually if I ask you what benefit is there in being in that state, has anybody kind of had that experience that they're willing to share? Yeah, I had an experience like that when I was 18 years old. I sort of slipped into this really quite deep depression mm -hmm. because I'd sort of, all my sort of hopes and dreams had all sort of been crushed. Um. I had a really bad outcome with a girlfriend um, and probably a fair way prior, but a whole bunch of these things built up. And then there was a point where just it seemed as though everything just fell away mm -hmm. and I was left and I was pretty much just stayed in bed for days, just feeling complete sort of, um, despair and a, and I sent and a sense of no direction no sense of purpose and yeah. really just not knowing what what to do and mm -hmm. so I just went into the state of of yeah of sort of stillness or state of shutting down yes and it very much is that strong sense of shutting down. And, and for most people, when they're in the midst of it, uh, even thoughts about I really should try and pull myself out of it feel like they just don't land in yeah, any way. Those, yeah. No. Like you can, it's almost like you're observing self, you're thinking I need to get up, I need to get moving, but there's just nothing happening. And it's really yeah. interesting because, you know, the vagus nerve does that deliberately to help the central nervous system actually to calm itself. But yeah. in a rational perspective, like our, our brain, our adult brain is looking at you going, come on, you loser, why don't you just get up and get on with it and, you know, this isn't going to help anything. But you just, like, at that moment, your whole system just needs to go into preservation mode. Yeah. It's almost like the <laughs> preserving life because it feels so overwhelming and I don't know what to do that I just need to kind of hit pause. Yeah. And a lot of people can feel quite critical about those situations, but it actually is an opportunity to almost like recharge the battery in your central nervous system mm -hmm. and your ability to kind of give yourself a breather and recognise that's what it is and it's it's an opportunity for a bit of a, a reset button, right? can then mean that you're you you're actually protecting yourself and recognizing that that's what you're doing and that this is okay but that there will come a time where we've recharged and regenerated enough and we can come out of it again but we don't have to be really horribly critical of self to kick yourself out of that that 
Mm. It's just an opportunity to recognize that for whatever reason, um, you know, pause is where your body needs to be right now and your system. And can you, you know, like you would nurture any, like I like to think about it like a baby state because babies, as you know, Mm. sleep a lot, right? There's this sense of their brains develop hugely while they're sleeping. The 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 yeah. primal kind of elements of their brain, you know, pairing, repairing, nurturing, pruning back, growing more synapses, all of this stuff happens while they sleep. And that ability to kind of recognise that our body's going into this cocoon state almost to regenerate yeah. is a right. really important point. That's interesting. Like uh, my wife's a doula and just, Obviously, we've had three kids now, so we've had a chance to observe it firsthand as well. But just one of the things, particularly with new mothers, is you know, and of course, I mean, the joy and excitement of a new newborn child is just incomprehensibly amazing. So you just want to play with them, touch them, move them, kiss them, smile at them, and dingle things in front of them. But I would notice that, uh, and then obviously, learned now through her and about this vagus nerve shutdown system that you're describing. That these <laughs> when you see it out in the world, you know, it's poor little babies. Basically, they're like. They obviously can't communicate. It's just like there's just too much stimulus for me and I'm just going to do do step one, which is freak out so that I get my central nervous system so freaked out that my vagus will take over and shut me down and then they'll end up in like this coma. And, and you know, and often obviously the new parents will not be aware that they're just overstimulating the crap out of the child till it reaches shutdown point when, you know, because of exactly what you said, they don't have the systematic structures to handle the stimulus, yeah? Yeah. It's powerful. It's interesting. We, we as adults, we hit those zones every now and then too. Yeah, we do. There's nothing wrong with the old, I mean, in a lot of plan work I've done with the men's stuff, when we see someone just not, not being able to process, we'll do we'll do fetal position work. So we'll get them and we'll put them on their side. We'll curl their legs up. We'll put their cross their arms over their heart, and then you place hands and you just let them go catatonic, um, and let that play out till there's yep. a, a because reason. the muscle memory actually takes over at That's, that point, right? Yeah, yeah. No. So and muscle memory is very powerful, but it is one of those things too. Like there's no better protective mechanism for self than curling up into a little ball, right? <laughs> it makes perfect sense. And your heart's on the inside of that. So whenever mm-hmm. there's especially affairs of the heart, I think they're they're big things because there is this sense of being disconnected or or you know, rejected in some way. That's the ultimate kind of point of of nurturing to regenerate. But then yeah. coming out of that and the ones that you see much more often in our adulthood now is this sense of child activation that goes into, you know, upset, like, and I want you to think about feeling like a child, that you're looking for a connection but you might be telling yourself that you're either undeserving of it and so therefore yeah. it's safer to stay alone or you are so desperate for the reconnect that you're doing everything that you can to make this person happy that they'll reconnect with you again. Mm. And it's a really important observation when we when we have this interaction with, you know, our loved ones and where we're triggered in whatever way, but we go into child mode, how that plays out. And, you know, does your child mode tend to withdraw and and, you know, tell yourself that you're better off staying away from everybody because, you know, nobody wants to be around you anyway because you're this or you're that or however it is. Um, Or do you kind of then try and, you know, make good, like go and, you know, do something for the other person so they'll think you're a good person again and reconnect and be grateful and, and, you know, thankful and give you a hug or whatever it is. Um, And, you know, I think it's an important one to sort of recognise how that plays out in our interpersonal relationships um, mm. because, you know, that sense of connect, and I think I said this to you before about what happens with my eldest daughter, and this is the one that I'm living with at the moment. So she's the only person I ever get into yelling arguments with, and it's usually because she yells at me first. But because I go into that dominant position, Right. What happens with her is that when she, it's like her protector and my protector will come out, but I'm always the dominant protector. And it usually takes a while, depending on what else is going on in her life. 
But if she's being unreasonable, I usually I just keep coming in with the this is my hard line and you will not cross it stuff. And eventually then she breaks and she goes straight into sobbing, crying child, right? And then she'll come straight back to me and try and connect and then she's, I'm sorry, you know, I'm whatever, whatever the excuse is, right? And it's just interesting because to observe it because it's much more noticeable in the way that sort of she interacts with me than what I notice, I mean, you know, probably because of my own personal circumstances, but I, it's not a way that I interact with others. Um, that need to sort of reconnect is um, something that we tend to do when we when we have a level of what I call an insecure attachment. So it's like it's what I'm trying to do because I'm trying to reconnect with this person and I'm feeling almost undeserving of their love and care and affection. And so I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be the best, the nicest, the most loving, the easiest going because I, I'm i trying to reconnect this thing that feels like I still don't feel like I'm good enough for. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, and it's an important point. I, I observe that I actually don't have that within me. <laughs> And the reason that I say that, I don't anymore. I probably used to, but I don't anymore. Um, And it's because I'm very much, I have my adult socialite part and I will reconnect on a way that's, I want to say, balanced. But and, And I'll accept another person's sort of position if they're telling me that they've done something or whatever. But in terms of, I suppose it's got to do with my own behavior that because I don't kind of erupt or kind of, you know, make a big deal out of things, I don't ever feel like I need to turn into this good child to feel worthy of this person connecting with me again. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's just an observation. I mean, everybody's different, right? And I'm going to say I'm much more like that because as I've got older and I've done more therapy, I realise that I don't, I don't activate that part of myself And because I'm also uh, much more internally responsible and take ownership of stuff as I've got older, I I don't tend to have it because I'm not looking for an insecure attachment. It's secure Mm. or it's not there is really what happens in my life. Mm. Mm. Um, But that's just because of the therapy that I've done, to be honest. Um, Mm. So, but, you know, a lone child is a place that I have, um, I would say I've seen more um, and that can feel, you know, I've been through some stuff with family. I've been through when, when all of the stuff that was going on for me in the last couple of years, you know, that sense of being alone in it led to a lot of, you know, withdrawal and Mm -hmm. feeling um, that I just needed to be avoidant um, because I sort of felt, rejected in some of that stuff so I'm much more familiar with the alone child than I am uh either of the other two yeah but everybody's going to be different right yeah yeah just to fill out that I look I'm amazed at at this here uh Kerry because very much I had that alone child very powerful through my teenage years because mm-hmm. I'd been sent off to boarding school by my parents when I was 10 years old. Yep. And I took that as a massive rejection of myself. Mm-hmm. And so through my teenage years, it was very much me acting out of that alone child and that, um, yeah, sort of seeking to compensate and, and out of the pain of that, there was a lot of addiction associated with it as well. And all of yep. that led to the the whole thing coming to a head when I was 18. Yep. And mm. going, and I, I don't know, I just instinctually ended up in this place by a series of circumstances. And just like you were saying, it was incredibly healing for me. It was like going into a cocoon. Mm. Mm. And and literally there was a rebirth, yeah. yeah. Um, for me at that age, and it went on, and it really led me back into um, a sort of healthy relationship, the beginnings of a healthy relationship with my parents, with my creative self, and and 
and all these other things. So yep. that's amazing. I've never, I've never um, really understood that as clearly as 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 this is revealed to me, which is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's good, and I think that's the part of this system that I think is just. I want to say so simple for most people to kind of grasp their head around the fact that you know, child, a child is instinctively triggered by a sense of fear, and and that's you know what they're trying yes. to avoid it one way or another. Whereas yes. protectors, if we flip to the opposite side, the protector comes out and displays a level of anger, and it can be mm. internally focused anger or externally focused anger, and it can yes. result in different kind of ways of reacting. So when I, I talk about your most extreme protector, and I'm just going to move, I, I need to, I'm just noticing the time. I just need yep. to move forward a little bit because I want to get to the end to make sure there's more in this. And I understand we probably want a bit more time to unpack it, but I want to give you, before we finish up tonight, the way of learning how to move between parts. Because yeah. the reason that I, I put a base name on them but what I want you to try and do is give them a, a, a more appropriate name that is more relevant to yourself. So, for example, um, you know, my most aggressive kind of part tends to be my Zena warrior princess part when I'm really overt about, you know, attacking somebody else because I feel like my safety or whatever is at risk. And I want you to remember that anger is a secondary emotion. Underneath anger is always fear or shame. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Fear and shame are our two of our lowest vibrating emotions and they're child personified. The child feels shame. The child mm. feels fear. That's what happens as we grow. So when we kind of get this passive, like we get this aggressive kind of part, if we become passive aggressive, it's because Usually when we've displayed any form of anger as a child, it was either not safe to do so or was completely dismissed as irrelevant. So in my in my case, it, you know, half the time I could have been angry till it all well, the cows came home, but it nobody did nobody paid any attention to you anyway. So it kind of didn't it didn't really do anything. So I learned that actually just kind of like internalizing it and going to my room and, you know, in my own head, I still, it's really funny. I still remember distinctly, I would often end up in my room thinking my mother had been taken over by an alien, that she couldn't possibly be my mother because she was so horrible. And, you know, that's just the little kind of rationale that you get as a child to justify why this person is behaving in a way that makes no sense to your brain, yeah. right? You need and they're the stories, yes, yeah, the stories yeah. that we tell ourselves so that we can cope it could, because this behaviour can't possibly be my real mother. An yeah. alien must have come down from a spaceship and taken over my mother's body. There is no other rational explanation for why this person would behave so horribly towards me, right? That was that was something that used to happen a lot, but I would be in my room, in my bed by myself while I'm thinking all of this stuff. So I learned actually to kind of hold it all in because it wasn't going to do me any favours by trying to let it out. So on the flip side... Um, if it's a more positive, and I want you to think about, you'll see from this diamond that when we get the extremes and then we have the child parts like the alone and the withdrawn, they tend to lead us down into the, the addictive parts, yeah. right? Because when we isolate and we withdraw, then we kind of look to something to manage the emotion because we're not actually rationally able to move it forward and resolve it. I want you to think that the other side of it, so the good child part and the assertive protector part, are both trying to do things to reconnect in a more rational and appropriate way. So these days, I, when I was younger, I had more passive aggression, but these days I tend to be more practically assertive. So mm. I will be very clear about what it is that I think needs to happen. But there's no nonsense about it. <laughs> I'm a no-nonsense kind of girl, but it's good. You know, I still remember one partner saying to me, 
it was always good that he absolutely knew whatever was wrong because I'd said that I was so well, like self-aware that I told him that when I get triggered by something, I tend to withdraw. So if I withdraw and I'm not talking to you and you ask me what's wrong and I say nothing, I'm fine, just leave it, right? Because by the next morning, usually in the shower, I would go, ah, oh, that's what happened, right? And, and I made a promise to him that then I would go back to him the next day and explain to him what it was that triggered me and why I reacted in that way. And he said to me that it was the best thing ever for him because he always knew what, what the problem was and we never had to have any argument about it. The only problem with that relationship was that he didn't know how to do that. <laughs> I knew how to do it, but he didn't know how to do it. So I was doing it all for everybody, but it, of course, doesn't work because you've got to be no. self-aware and do your own stuff, right? Yeah. And it's good to so, open these things. I was just thinking we practice NVC repairs, um, the nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg repairs and with the kids. So yeah. there'll be an exchange, there'll be a trigger that's got to play its course. And then we, you know, we come back and we do the repair. It's like this happened, I felt. Then I did this. Th this happened, I felt. Then I did this. Mm -hmm. And we we try to get some kind of ground zero going if we can, you know, emotionally speaking. This is between the kids or, you know, us when we can, although they, yep. <laughs> they're often better than us at doing it. <laughs> yep. Um, and because they don't have all the layers of stuff that you right. do to filter yeah. through it. No, that, that's what I'm seeing now, like... Um, because there are so many layers under each one. So the, the protector anger is not necessarily the only manifestation because the protector can masquerade as, um, you know, comp you know, a high level kind of, you know, almost righteousness. And, you know, yeah. I, what I said is just the absolute definitive truth. And I'm totally cool and calm about that. I'm not being passive aggressive. I just got it. I've got it sorted and you don't, and you won't get past my, sh my, my shields. <laughs> You know, there's so many layers in these different ones, but I guess let me see if I'm getting it right. If we can understand the fact that there's that level of interplay going on in these elements and relationship in these elements and layering, that's the awareness that unlocks the ability to 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 shift it and to to find ways to navigate. You know, really, that's like is that kind of that's like the core. Yeah. So it's in, it's it's actually embracing all of these Letting, parts yeah. of self going, okay. and developing yes. this much greater awareness that actually yeah. when my Zen warrior princess, what used to happen very early on, and I remember very distinctly having, you know, my protector, Zena used to want to, you know, cut my four-year-old's head off because really she was this pain annoying thing that used to constantly get me into these situations because she was noisy or she was, you know, too loud, too whatever, much, yeah, too yeah. over the top, right? And she yeah, just yeah. needed to sit down and shut up and, you know, whatever yeah. and not be so out there and stop drawing attention to herself, right? And that was one of the constant criticisms in my own head to myself yeah. until I – and and there was always this almost four-year-old kind of going, I'll do whatever yeah. I want. I'm going to always make it worse, right, because yeah. I just was like, uh, I don't care what you think of me, I hate you anyway, because I didn't recognise that that this was actually two aspects of my own self. And the whole point of all of this, and if you read The Trouble with Trauma, I talk about it, is this recognition that Zena only developed because I was trying to internalise an adult part to help me self-criticise before I got into trouble from the adults outside. So she mm -hmm. is the personification of all of this criticism that I got as a child to keep me in check. And that yeah. the only way she learned how to do that was to criticise me first, but then she was also very good at standing up for me on the outside. Mm. And then yeah. when I could get her to turn and see that her real job in this world, she only exists because the child needs her protection, Yeah, yeah. all of a sudden this sense of self-connection and self-love and recognition yeah. of all of my yeah. parts of self in this body, in this mind, all of a sudden now we start to live in complete harmony. And Ilma was talking about that. Like I've got full body tingles just talking yeah. about how yeah. much my inner parts recognise and love this 
true egocentricity of me, which is that lovingly beautiful, you know, innocently out there four year old, right? That's right. Yeah, that that, that yeah. center of you. Yeah, that's it's it, we've got we've got you know one of our our for our four year old, <laughs> she we say we sometimes call her Zena Warrior Princess. She's got that. And it just at, at the massivest level. And so we've tried a completely different tact with her where it's like um, just completely acknowledge that massive behavior, massive sounds, massive defiance, and then hear it, recognize it, but don't fold to it, but don't react to it, not the, the anger and the don't do this, and the, just hold, just present firm line. And then if we do that, normally, if we can, we can't always because we're tired parents and all the rest of it, but when we pull that off, yeah, she she goes, okay, I, I am this big thing. I haven't been criticised for it. She doesn't in, she, she doesn't start internally criticising herself, which I think it starts at a young age, right, even four. And then she softens and goes, I'm loved. And then she comes and goes, then she'll soften and she'll connect and she'll drop the behaviour and she'll come in for an embrace, yeah. But whenever yeah. we hold that line, it's almost like what you're saying is already starting at age four. She, in the back of her little head, it's like, right, okay, I am that. I'm going to up-level that now. I'm going to go, yeah. I'm, okay, cool, right, What well, you know, I am the little whatever you're saying. I'm going to go up another level. The, the reason and the reason it happens at four, so this is developmentally, right? Yeah, right at so, that four. So from the, from the time we're born till the time that we're about 18 months to, right, we we have this complete dependency and no yes. ability to actually look after ourselves whatsoever. And yeah. that's why at two we start to kind of start to recognise that we can manage our external environment by behaving in certain ways, which is why terrible twos happen. We yeah. throw tantrums. We're actually, because we're frustrated, we don't have the communication skills to get what we want, but we also have this sense of give me what I want Every time I cried or made a noise before you gave me what I wanted, well, actually what I needed, but at two we develop desire and then I want stuff and I can't have that. But hang on, you always gave me everything that I needed before. Why won't you give me what I want? And that's where you develop the tantrums and the two and then they learn to say no and then parents react to the no and then they kind of like then they get power and then there's this differential. But they always still at that point believe that you know what they're thinking. And part of the reason that they get so frustrated as two-year-olds is because they've always thought you knew what they were thinking. That's how you met their needs before. Now That's why right. can't you give them their desires? Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because the baby cries and pretty much, you know, the, the yeah. primary carer will we go, okay, we, you want we, booby, you want to get changed. Yeah. So it's like stimulus response, stimulus yes. response, and then, and yeah. then all of a sudden it's like, hang on a minute. <laughs> Yep, now I've got desire and what do you yeah. mean you're not going to give me what I want, right? Yeah. That makes no sense. Let me scream the house down until I get it. And then and you can you even know, do that if you're like 55 and the CEO of a multinational corporation. Absolutely, <laughs> because if you've done that, and, 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 and know, that people have responded to, have a fairly to it. fairly systemic impact at that level. Absolutely. Right. So then at a, uh, I want you to go back to then oh. why does it change again at four? Because at four oh. is the first time that you recognise that you can have a thought that another person doesn't know unless you tell them. And you know yeah. that because a four-year-old exactly. will come to you and say, I'm Yes. That's when they've got a secret, that's when they've yeah. recognised and they know that they can think something in here that you don't know unless I tell you. Prior to that, they think they're just an extension of the parent. Yep. Now, the problem Literally. with that is that what then comes quickly after is a sense of responsibility because if I can think things that you don't know and then I act in ways that you're not aware of and then I get into trouble, all of a sudden now it's my fault and mm. I did something wrong. And they take that with them up until they're seven and that's when it gets cemented in. The sense of I'm not good enough absolutely develops between the ages of four and seven. Mm -hmm. So it's key learning and it's key opportune time so going back to what you said about acknowledging her zina is an yep. important part of her being yep. validated, but yep. she also needs to just be reminded that she can have big, strong feelings and how do we get them out? But just because she has big, strong feelings doesn't actually make her the boss of it all. 
that's that's the that's the tack that we've been taking that's been much yep. more successful lately. So so yeah. one thing rich about that is encourage her to go stomping. And yeah, yeah, we do. For a, anybody who just saw the um, if you haven't seen it, we watched it the other night. The Wiggles documentary. My goodness, yeah. that was so much. It was so interesting. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it because it was quite. I was quite astonished by the whole thing, but. Dorothy the dinosaur goes stomping and it's one of those things I used to do with kids because it will the bilateral stimulation by moving side to side actually brings their arousal down. Right, and especially if you ask them, like that's why if you, I say to people, you've got a real problem, don't sit down and, and have coffee with your girlfriend and, and whinge about it because it will just perpetuate so the same. If you go for a walk and talk it out, yeah, then it true. actually changes and it's because yeah. You're crossing the midline of your brain. It's the it's the therapeutic stimul bilateral stimulation. You're doing it within your own body. If we teach four year olds to do it, or we pick them up from school and we walk them home from school and we ask them how their day was and they download all of the things that upset them. So Suzanne, if you're still listening, that's the way to manage today is when kids are saying cruel things, you want to validate it, but you want to get them to talk about it while they're walking because yeah, bilaterally we're stimulating the brain. Yeah. And it works yeah. to bring the arousal down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then on that note, and I'm just conscious of the time. So I'm I'm sorry for people to, you know, get to the end and we haven't finished, but the rational parts of self are the parts that we really want to spend time investing in. That's your mm -hmm. working part, that's your socialite part, that's your part that seeks the answers, that's that part that looks for knowledge, problem solves right? These three parts of self are the ones who should be working as the holy trinity in managing your life. Mm. So we have working parts and you said, Rich, you've got that, you know, the boss who organizes everything and manages everything. So there's the worker and then there's the socialite and the socialite is responsible for connecting in with family, friends and others. Community, but if you're yeah. working a lot and you're not having a lot of social time, then usually the partner ends up filling that space and it's not really it doesn't work as well. You need more balance in it. 100%. Yeah, yeah. And then the seeker part is the part that we go to when we've got a problem and we're trying to work out how to solve it. And yeah. we can we can seek the advice of a sage or somebody else or, you know, we can sit in classes like this and can we learn wisdom and we can share yeah. that and we can talk to others. But the only way that we can actually resolve our problems is actually by being honest about what they are and looking yeah. for the right solutions. Yes. All right. Now, I'm sure there might be some questions around this, but what I want to do is try and just give you the next little bit, and then when we get to the end, I think if there's anybody's got any specific questions, then we can go back to it. There are a couple of ways that I talk about this with people to help you understand the emotional variability and then how to manage it. And I want you to think about, your old jukebox, right? Remember, you know, go back to happy days and the whole you walk in and you put your 20 cents in and you choose your song and you've got your milkshake and you're waiting for your song and every time the end of the next song comes on but you're waiting for the next song, you've queued it and you've queued it in a line but you don't know how long it's going to take because you didn't see how many people put 20 cents in before you did, mm -hmm. right? So I want you to think about that as, that's where you might be at now. You might be a bit further along, but if it's something that you're only starting to become aware of managing your emotions, your decision to put the 20 cents in the machine and choose your song is a good start, but sometimes it takes a little while before your song actually comes on. You could finish your milkshake before it's there, and that can be a bit frustrating because it doesn't feel like it's an instant response. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The next one you've got is um, I've got the old cassette deck because it's kind of like you might be able to go and remember that the song that you want is on this particular tape, but you have to kind of go and cue it. And depending on how good your cassette recorder was, it might go to the next song. You might just have to keep hitting fast forward and stop and playing to see if you're up to your right song yet or not. And that can feel a little bit clunky because you can't quite get to the song that you want but at least it feels like you're more in control of making the selection. Mm -hmm. The next one is actually going back to the old vinyl LP where you can actually go to the song that you want and you can put it on and you can choose and select. So you've got this awareness that you can actually then go and bring the emotional part in that you want when you want it. 
but it's still a little bit clunky. Then you go to having your electronic device where you've got it like an iPod where it's right there and you can find it relatively easily. But the ideal situation I want you to think about is that you can pre-record a playlist for any particular circumstance. Yeah, interesting. Right? So that we know when we've got to get up and go to work and do these things that we Mm. can set this intention about how we want to show up emotionally, that we can put that in place beforehand, that we can plan it out, and that we can then kind of, you know, start it from when we wake up in the morning, right? Yeah. Because language and intention setting is a huge part about how you manage this system. Yeah. So mastery over your system is something that requires maintenance. And for those of you who signed up for the um, the program that I put in the um, into the Aware Entrepreneur tribe in the share here the other day when I talked about today's masterclass, I also shared a link to an app that I've developed that's got mastering your mindset on it that's a 10 um it filters out i think it's eight days it filters out over a week anyway and each day you get like a little 10 minute learning and it talks a lot about language because language is actually how you master moving from one part to another so the reason that i ask you to name the parts is because my worker part i know I used to I used to talk about as as focused because I just needed to be focused right now. So what I would do is if I woke up in the morning and I was kind of like, you know, things might be tough or there's a lot going on or whatever, but if I can say to myself, okay, I just need to be really focused right now. I've just got to focus and get on this stuff. What I do is I'm calling in my focused part. Mm. If I wake up in the morning and I'm telling myself that I'm just, oh, like this happened last year when I was, feeling really, I, I, I would say to people, I feel really lost and I caught myself because I recognised that while ever I was telling everybody that I was lost, I was not going to be able to find a way out of it. I was just mm-hmm. going to keep continue to being lost. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I said was that I, I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling a bit confused right now, but I'm, I'm actually seeking the path out. That's right. And that actually called my seeking part into consciousness so that I could find a resolution to, you know, what I was going to be doing next and make decisions that would align with where I wanted to go to. Even though I didn't have necessarily a clear idea of, you know, what that path looked like at that point, but it allowed me to at least then take those steps. Mm. Even if it was a step <clears throat> and each step needed to be acknowledged and and I would make sure that I was very consciously cutting the language that was negative and keeping me caught in the negative downward spiral, not in a critical way, but just noticing it. And when I notice it, I would say, okay, that's not really helping right now. I know why I feel that way, but I'm just going to make a cup of tea and then I'm, then I'm, then I'm going to get focused. Mm. And what that did was gave me a point in time So Mm. I don't sit there and lament myself for being a total hopeless, useless idiot person because I can't motivate myself or move myself forward. I just go, okay, today's not my best day, but I'm I'm just going to recognize that it's not my best day. Notice the energy. Okay, I'm just going to. I need to do a few things. I'm going to get focused. I'm going to make a cup of tea, and then I'm going to get on. And then I'm going to get focused and I'm going to stay focused as long as I can manage. And then at the end of all of that, I would acknowledge what I was able to do. And invariably, the reflection back at what I was able to do always surprised me because I kind of didn't feel like Mm. I had that much energy. And yet here I was at the end of the day going, oh, well, I actually did tick off quite a few things, right? But it's how we speak to ourselves. And, and it's the energetic we, shift. It's it's the calling yeah. of that energy. Otherwise, I mean, God, the amount of countless thousands of hours I know I've lost or wasted not being able to recall it because because I, I couldn't give it a definitive. Um, I couldn't exactly that. I couldn't define it as as something in order to shift into it. It's like 
why is this car not going any faster? And then looking down going, well, you probably need to move the gear stick from, from position one to position two. That's why it's got the number two written on it. It's a separate position to position one. Consciously put the hand on it, move it. But, you know, you know, not a lot of people are teaching that stuff to us in schools, right? No, <laughs> We're no. Get, you know, or, or in other places, you know, in, yeah. in a lot of cases, you know. Yeah. And that was one of the things... One of the things that I managed to get around when I, if I caught myself reflecting back on, you know, how much I wasn't doing in comparison to how much I used to do, Perfect. one of the things, one of the, or sometimes the why, why is all of this stuff happening, especially at one point where it just seemed like everywhere I turned, there was another smack in the face. Yeah. And it was just like, if I hmm. bought into all of that, I would have been in this place where I'd be thinking, forget it, I'm just going to get, I'm never going to get up again, right? But I do things like when I don't feel like getting up, I play things like Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba, which is I get knocked down but I get up again and they're never going to keep me down. And I will keep it on repeat until I feel like I can get up. Mm. And I was just, I just shared something today on Instagram actually about how our DNA actually responds to the vibration of music and why Mm certain music actually will help to energize you. And I noticed this, if I want to, if I need to focus on something and I'm feeling particularly lethargic, if I actually put some upbeat music on, I will find that my energy picks up. Natural. And so helping to recognize those things and, and pull together, I want to say your own little toolkit of what works for you, because what works for me may not be the same as what works for somebody else, but it's, it's okay for everybody to have their own little kind of ways of doing things when we can acknowledge and understand what's actually happening and how we manage it. But language is a big part of it. And so what I started saying to myself, when everything, when, when another thing would come and knock me, I would have a little bit of time in that fetal position. And I mean a little bit because I was acknowledging that that's where I was and I'd go, okay, yeah. I need a little bit of nurture. I'll do that right now. But while I was in that, instead of focusing in on all of the negative, why is this happening? I just kept telling myself, I must be going to do something pretty damn amazing for all of this negative energy to keep trying to stop me from doing it. Mm. Yeah. And what I was doing then was putting this intention out there that something amazing was coming because all of this. Exactly. Yes, it's right. That future focus was always kind of there because I didn't understand why or how, but I just knew. And, you know, and hindsight's an amazing thing. In reflection, I can kind of see that my capability of being able to do what I'm going to do just would never have happened if I wasn't forced out of the state that I was in, if I wasn't forced out of the comfort zone. So language controls the system. So when we acknowledge the feeling, right, we can acknowledge it, we want to, you know, recognize that, okay, today's not my best day. My energy's a bit flat. That's okay. What am I going to do to try and help boost my energy a little bit and then move the next bit forward, right, without berating myself about the fact that I'm not good enough or whatever else? So resolution of the system can come from this sense of all of our parts feeling like they are all unified parts of a single system and that they all have a valuable contribution to make, that we all have these parts of us that have developed out of a need to protect ourselves or a sense of feeling rejected, but actually their behaviour is all designed to keep you protected in one way or another. And when we can see that, we can bring our sort of system back in together so there's this small little happy family of people who really are your ultimate champions even when they you know don't necessarily feel like it all the time yeah yeah. that makes sense Mm. makes sense and then we get to this point where we have absolute resolution of the system and our four-year-olds are jumping around having an awesome awesome time and actually loving and accepting who we are as individuals and how we all have that unique kind of way of contributing to the world and that we don't have to be like everybody else, but we do just love who we are. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah, this All good. Beautiful. 
Beautiful. All right. Well, I think that's one, enough one for one night. Tiny, one final thing I want to say on that topic is uh, I notice, I mean, obviously because of the nature of this project, but so, for example, we've been through an intense time recently with moving house into the new house and a whole heap of different things. This is the longest period of time that I haven't sat in clan group with with my my clan, my men's clan, um, mm-hmm. and like I've been, I'm you know I go every two weeks um, for nearly a decade, um, pretty much without fail, yeah. Um, but this has been a bit of a stretch over this recent period, and the, the cracks start forming, and it's kind of like whilst I can have these systems and these understandings, if I don't have a forum in which elements of my self-sustaining system are reflected back to me, supported by others, and actually almost like uh, it's like they help that circular reflection helps me recognize my tools. It's, it's almost like you walk too long alone and it's like, hey, these are great tools, but are they actually tools? Do they actually work? Where's the, you know, there's no there's no support around them. Operate. I know for me, you know, even though I've got some pretty good ones up my sleeve, I start to crack and I really miss it. And like I said to one of the fellows today, I was like, um, you know, old habits are starting to come in. There's certain numbing that's coming in. I've got pretty high level tools and stuff, but obviously with the exhaustion, the tiredness and the whole range of, you know, story I won't go into, not having that space to, to, to get another person to go, hey, Rich, check out, you know, and multiple people go, hey, there's your tools, that's working. This, you know, it's almost like they start, I start to lose the ability to wield them. Yeah, well, I mean, because that was the other thing, if you stop and think about, like, even connecting remotely and online, it mm. is helpful, but it's it doesn't, it can't replace this face-to-face connection that you get well, because yeah. of the energy that we bring to each other and the, the yeah. vibration of actually that emotional element that we get from being close to those people who have always provided you some level of support, right? That's mm. why when you look at things like 12-step programs and stuff, the biggest part of that is turning up and actually connecting in with people who give you this sense of validation for yes. the circumstances that you're in regardless. It's actually yes. that connection and, you know, you must go to meetings and you must because you must commune. It's the sense of connecting and communing with each other that keeps people feeling like actually who they are and how they're behaving is more normalised and accepted and supported when people then choose to make change. And so clans do a lot of that sort of same work where they're providing this sense of, you know, validation and support and connection to people who are, you know, basically telling you that this is all normal and moving forward, but what can we do to kind of, keep assisting you rather than just holding you in the space because you know a bit I always say to people it's a bit like teaching a child to walk you know you can just keep carrying them around but it's not helpful right and I use another analogy talking about how we learn to drive a car that you know a therapist or a coach's role is actually not to be your chauffeur in driving you in your life it's actually to teach you how to drive I'm yeah, I'm the driving instructor, much. right? I'm not your chauffeur. And actually it would be remiss of me to just keep chauffeuring you. And that's a big part of where I think the benefit of learning from different people is making sure that we're not just getting lifts from everybody in the clan group to kind of hold us, but they're actually teaching us how to how to, you know, self-embody and, and take care of ourselves with that support. Yeah, yes. 100%. Spot on. That's the vision for sure. That's, yeah, that's cool. Be- wow. Beautiful. Amazing. Yeah. All that's good. So, yeah, wow. I'm just going to double check, double check our chats and make sure I haven't missed anything. Um, Valentine, do you want to say hi? Do you want to, you, do you want to pop your video and say, I saw your question there, thought was that you wrote in about your parents. Um, and uh, Dane, is that you? I think that's you, isn't it? Dane, happy, healthy. So if you guys feel like, and you're, these are probably people that are not in the tribe as yet, but that have popped on tonight to have a, see if you're not feeling shy, can't you pop on and say hi? And Anthony's been there as well. Thanks for coming along and tuning in. And this recording, Kerry, like just so everyone knows, um, I'll take back the host. The recording will be... Uh, inside our community, um, if you go down to our wisdom bank, um, 
this one it's tricky because it's really crossing over a bit in in yeah in the relationship and family but i think it's it's centered more in the health and self arena i think Yes. um so when you go to the health and self tab in the wisdom bank um in a few days the recording of this wisdom class including a link to contact kerry um will be posted in there so for, for, that's where it'll be and then we'll share it up in the share here so that people can find it as well Kerry, any final stuff or anyone q and anyone's got questions final comments Oh, Valentine's just saying she can't switch a microphone on. That's why she wasn't able to uh say do you anything. want to ask a Um, question Valentine do well, you want she to say was just something? talking about the fact that she thought her, her parents had adopted her and, and resented the fact that they had, which um I can perfectly understand. I've done lots of therapy work with people um who have been adopted, and there's a whole bunch of um. Oh, sorry, a he. Beg my like, excuse me, you know, of course, but um, the sense of um, it's not, it's the rejection of um, the biological parents and the resentment in some ways of the of the adoptive parents that cause the biggest issues, um, and sometimes part of the biggest challenges is that there is an innate belief, like almost. energetically we know that there's a sense of not quite belonging or not quite connecting in and not really understanding why and a lot of kids who are never told that they're adopted but they always have this sense of just not belonging and not really understanding and those things are so ingrained as a strong part of our dna it's just quite amazing there is a lot of um there's some really good so i'm an emdr consultant so emdr therapy is extremely good at being able to get to the base of some of these Yes. um you know challenges and being able to actually resolve them in the subconscious without you having to consciously think about what you have to change them um and especially those attachment challenges um i still remember probably one of the most powerful sessions i ever had was i I um I had this session about being I could see myself in utero and knowing that my mother didn't want me and it was because I was a completely unplanned pregnancy and not you know but there was just this and and this imbibed sense and it just what was interesting about that was even though it was it was a very powerful um session but it made all of a sudden it made so much sense about why i had this sense of you know rejection almost from the the get go and yeah. you know just this you know belief and i wrote about it in one of the books and i remember i you know and i really must preface it my mother is not a she's not a horrible person i just think he's really out of touch and in some ways i want to say almost ignorant of the impact um and you know i think a large part of that is part of her generation too um yes. but when i sent to her i was, i want you to know what's in the book because i didn't want her to be um surprised that i would write about it um and i said to her i'm not blaming you it, it's my own sort of perception of self but it was an important part of my healing journey mm-hmm. and she came back to me and she said Yeah, well, I don't understand why you make such a big deal out of it. I didn't want any of you, so I don't understand why it's such a big problem for you. <laughs> yeah, <but laughs> there you go, and and and, and yeah, look, that's it. her experience. There it that, is. That and and you know, in the work you're teaching her, that's her experience. That's exactly. Yeah, and that's right. What, like in rite of passage work, they so I do um, initiations for young men. So we'll take, we will sever them from the mother. We'll, we will. go through a ritualistic deliberate severance where we you know if they didn't think they were an alien before we make them the alien in that moment by saying this is it yeah you know at this point it is you know and then you are and then bang out into the bush and it's through a whole another process to be able to reconnect from a place of severing all of those interconnected elements that is that that have driven them to then or an influence to them so that there is a deep embodied sense of self responsibility around emotional behavior reactivity and projection into the world and so indigenous cultures built that in multiple versions of it multiple so that that was naturally occurring whereas we have 
our solution is um, no initiation, no rites of passage, but therapy to then try no, and yeah, no, manage, try no to manage it from no our rites of passage. Back no down communing, no, no, yeah, so then, no talking openly about it. No, 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 no because it's, it's not built in to the, the progressional cycle. So then we do it in reverse engineering through, you know, traditionally, uh, obviously through therapy and things like that. But a lot of that's changing. And, you know, what you said about your parents, I, I laugh sometimes, like I said, I'm a partner. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like we're, we're all just humans trying our best in many different ways. There's so many flaws and failings in what we've done. Man, I, yeah. I sometimes I say to her, oh, she was a... I reckon that's, you know, that's another two years of therapy, whatever happened then, we'll just have to face it, we'll just have to deal with it, just keep it open. You know, phone's always open, call us anytime you want to blame all your entire life issues on your childhood because probably, definitely, I would say we contributed to it. I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's right. I say, I say that to my girls. I go, yeah, you know. You maybe get two phones, okay, call me on that number. Yeah. When it's like, <laughs> hey, listen, I've just got to let you know once again, destroyed my entire life and, you know, pretty much yeah. <laughs> call me on that one. I think or... that's the thing though is also presenting yourself. It's what I said to Suzanne earlier, presenting yourself as the fact that you're you're not perfect, right? As a parent, you're far from perfect. And and it's one of the things that we have to actually manually do for our children is is show them our infallibility. Yeah. Um, because mm -hmm. it's the thing that actually helps them to recognize that that it's okay to make mistakes. It's incredibly um, powerful. Definitely. You know, it's, it's a it's, learning. It's sport. so scary. Like, it's so scary. Like, recently, with the, I've done it a few times. I actually, and, you know, we encourage it in my men's work. So I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll get some tears going. And, you know, it's really hard to, to do it. And it's like, oh, no, as a parent, it's like, no way, you know. But then as soon as I do it, like, my seven year old will go, okay. And I'll, I'll go, look, nothing to do with you guys. There's a lot of this going on. This, you know, this happened. Dad did this and that. And I'm feeling this. And just letting you guys know, and then just boom, down comes the energy yeah. in the house, and then they can go, oh, okay, so, okay, I, I kind of get him because you know I burst into tears every fifteen minutes, but he does it once every fifteen months, so it must, you know, it's it's natural. <laughs> it's like, I, I was you. I sorry, but I I thought it was a mate of mine, Dane, who has happy, healthy, strong as well. How are you, bro? I didn't know you were there. Oh, he's he's cool. I just, just said gone. thanks was very cool in the notes. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 because he had a different name on for for his um his handle for tonight. Kerry, incredible, hey, like it's just that was we'll, amazing. We will we'll go through the recording and we'll we'll try to find some. Um, I'll send it over to Declan and we'll see if we we'll pull out some shorts and some some power pack moments and we can hopefully we can get those over to you as well. Oh, beautiful. No problem. So much. Asha, right. want to say anything, Asha? I was just going to write and say thank you so much, you know, action-packed and um, so much there that's able to be applied in so many contexts. So thank yeah. you for your wisdom. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, not long to go for you beginning that journey as well. With <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, I, less, less than 16 weeks. So really? I know, I know, time wow. just flies. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, we'll catch up soon on the old tribe or I'll reach out and touch base. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. You too. Oh, be well. All right. Okay. Well, we'll do yes, a wrap. So thanks Valentine, so much. Valentine, Anthony, Anthony, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Kerry, you want to stay on for just a minute, Martin? We'll say sure. Yep. No worries. Uh, I've got to fix something here. Uh, yes, done. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to, uh, there it is, untick that. Up your YouTube. Yeah, I'm just trying to get that to not do it. How do you do that? Probably, hmm, it's not going to do it. It's not playing, not playing ball. YouTube won't stop. Well, we'll talk after, but basically, yeah, like a debrief. But yeah, um, beautiful. No Thank problem. You. Thank you so we much. We can, we can, we can make time to chat um, if you need to. Yeah, yeah. Some no, other time this week, anyway. Yeah, and I'll send it over to Declan and see if we can get some some shorts cut out. It'd be nice to see what comes out. Awesome. All right. See you soon. All right. Have a good Amazing. night. Thanks so much, Kerry. See ya. 
Incredible. Bye. Ah.